Do you want to publish your game on Steam? Do you want to be the next big thing? Do you want to be filthy rich? Well, now you can with Steamworks from Heathen Engineering, available on the Unity Asset Store. This live dev interview was taken from all the W's dot twitch.tv slash the messy coder where we interviewed heathen engineering not only about steamworks but also about their bouncing physics and many other amazing things so sit back and join i'll see you all in a second everybody sing at home give a warm and sincerely messy welcome to load them from Heathen Engineering, creators of not only Steamworks Complete, but also the Fizzkit Complete as well, which I love so much. I love this dust. Welcome back, buddy. How have you been? Been doing good. Been doing good. <laughs> oh, I love your dancing bottoms. Mate, I just noticed something. I just noticed something. Steamworks uh, Volume 1, I was going to say Volume 1, Version 1, is still on the store, and you've got v2 yep so v1 is based around unity 2018 lts and unity was supposed that unity technology was supposed to drop lts support for 2018 when they released the 2021 lts they didn't uh so our our little setup is to keep v1 in line as long as 2018 lts is in primary support and then when unity deprecates 2018 lts we will deprecate V1 ah, uh, because okay. V2 is not 2018 LTS compatible. Okay, so anyone who's already got, uh, obviously for those who aren't aware, deprecation means if you already have it, then don't worry because it will still be in your downloads. Uh, it, but, you, but new people just can't buy it. So deprecating doesn't mean that it's gone forever. And, oh no, my asset that I purchased has disappeared. No, no, it's still in your library. You can still download deprecated assets. Um, just new people can't buy it. And it, then people like Heaven Engineering wouldn't have to worry about supporting different people. Would you still be supporting old people using version one if they came to you with a, with a, with a question or a query? Well, yeah, we always... Uh provide an open support. Of course, with 2018 LTS falling off the mark, we can only support it as well as Unity supports 2018 LTS. But uh, yeah, we we won't let you uh, flounder out there. Oh, that's so lovely of you. Because uh, a good, like Dan v. Cool says, that's good. Keep it available until the software it was designed for goes away. And I still see people complaining um, in reviews on the Asset Store with things like, doesn't work at Unity 2017. It's like saying it doesn't work in Unity 4. One star. We actually had a request to port to Unity 5. Were you tempted? Uh, we did offer to support them porting it themselves. Because technically, it should work uh, in Unity 5. Everything except for the editors. But you don't really need the editors if you're, if you're fine with that. Was their response... No way, it's far too hard to, to do it myself. Uh, Why do well, you want us to do it for you? <laughs> they, they started looking into it, started working on it, asked if uh, we could contract, and we're just too busy. So I think they ended up moving up to 2019 LTS. I think it's easier just to move your project, isn't it, at the end of the day? It's, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, lot, it's a lot of headache, but it's better in the long run. Unless, um, you know, we're, we're not going to talk about 2020 and the... Uh, the spinning circle of death, the pop-ups of doom. Oh my gosh. Are you enjoying yeah. 2020 at all, Loden? Uh, we've got two projects on 2020 and one on 2021. So 2020 is not my friend. Uh, we do a bit <laughs> of work there, but it it has some challenges, especially around the um, UI toolkit, I think it's called. So that's a bit buggy on 2020. 2021's nice though. I'm enjoying that one. Really? 20, yes. 2021's good. Uh, well, I said I am enjoying working on it. Uh, it. It's got plenty of challenges. It also has some new bells and whistles in there that are fun to play with. I probably wouldn't want to do a big giant project on it, but the uh, the project we have running on 2021, it's suitable for the engine. Is does it have the pop up of diff on 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 2021 as well? Is it like constantly going? Whoa, wait a minute. Oh, what? Hang on. Did you? Did you want to did you want to do something no 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 let's wait for 20 minutes first and then i'll let you do it does he does I, he do that 
It, it actually hasn't been too bad. The The project in question is a WebGL uh, PlayFab based project. So it's pretty lightweight anyway, but you know, I've been presently surprised with 2021, especially with working on a WebGL project. Oh my word, I might actually have to have a poke at it. You've, you've, you've actually piqued my We don't interest. make mistakes. Oh. We have happy accidents. Lurking Ninja has just subbed. Thank you so much, Lurking Ninja. 11 months, you beautiful badger. Uh, and I, <laughs> that reminds me, I can't turn down the volume on the alerts. Um, so I'm going to turn the, alert, the audio alerts off for the, <laughs> for the bomb bombs because that just deafened me. I do apologize. Um, here we go. Alerts box. Volume off. Uh, thank you so much, buddy. And um, you, of those those who remember Event Engineering coming on the stream uh, last time, you don't just do multiplayer stuff and dancing bottoms. You've also got um, the the U, UIX uh, complete, which we had a peek about with. But where where is your where, where's your um, the beautiful badger over there? Hang on, Here we, my eyes. My eyes are going blind. Dun, 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 system core, there it is. Oh my god, I'm scrolling for 20 minutes. By the way, those who are looking for a free gift, Steamworks version 2 Foundation Edition for free. What's the difference? What is that? What is this free free gifts? So Foundation is, uh, well, it's the foundation of Steamworks. It includes all the basic bits that you'd need to get started. Uh, so it'll integrate steamworks.net. It'll handle stats, achievements, friends, your basic bits and bobs. Doesn't include any of the bigger bells and whistles, but of course, if you want to go raw API, the, the full raw API is there through steamworks.net. So it's a, it's a good way of seeing how we do things and getting accustomed to it. When did it come out? Because I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm dumbfounded, uh, speechless, even. You know, there's, uh, oh, for that, the first, you know, Look, not enough ratings. It's free. Why 55 views only in the past week? What is this? Why is why are you all not grabbing things that are free? Are, you, is it, are, are we uh, in the realms of not getting the visibility on the asset store now? Or is this just like literally came out this week? No, it came out at the same time as Steamworks Complete V2. So they both dropped at the same time. Um, Electronics, thank you so much for the sub, buddy. Two months in a row, beautiful. Uh, Badger. Mate, so why do you... What, are people just not noticing that you're, you're giving away presents for free? Or are they just jumping straight into the paid one because of all the extra bells and whistles, like you were saying? It seems like they're going straight into uh, complete. So we've got quite a few new devs that have come on board with, with the V2 release. So I guess, uh, well, we went from 600 to 900 in the Discord server there. So a big old jump with V2. I just put a link there in chat if anyone wants to join the Heaven Engineering Discord. There you go, there's a link. How easy is it, Big Gummy says, to go from the free version to the paid version? Great question. It, you should have no friction at all. So uh, the paid version is everything that the free version is, plus more tools and toys and bells and whistles. So if people are, are umming and ahhing at the moment to get Steamworks, which, by the way, is on a 50% sale, uh, if you weren't aware of that, if I haven't said it enough, exclamation mark Steamworks in chat, uh, then yeah, you grab the free one uh, and then upgrade yourself to the to the, uh, the the version two. Now at the moment, if you get the free one, you do get a fifty percent discount on the complete one. So <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist it. Right? So I couldn't resist. Now you also got other free stuff. I just noticed down here. What's this space war? So Space War is actually part of V1, and that's uh, we did a bit of work creating a, a clone, not a true clone, uh, our, our take on uh, Steam's App 480. It's properly called Space War. So it's a, a lightly playable game built on uh, Steamworks V1. We will be pulling that one down with, uh, when V1 gets deprecated, and we're looking at doing something similar for V2. Oh, cool. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, um, that project you're saying is what is the the default um, test one that you get with when you pay your your hundred bucks whatever it is with Steam to, to 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 connect with them or is it something different to that? 
it's the test app that valve has so if you just go download the sdk i'm pretty sure anyone can just go download the sdk it'll include space war which was originally written in c it's a uh, an old classic game that they use to demonstrate the features of the api we took all of the the demonstrations that they had for the original steam api and wrapped them up in a little light unity project just so you can see the game flow uh, it does basic uh, networking via mirror but like I said, you would need uh, Steamworks V1 complete installed and you would need Mirror installed. And Mirror updates every, I swear, every five minutes. So uh, <laughs> check us on the Discord server if you need help getting that running. Um, I thought we had a Mirror command. We've got a Viz, hang on, Viz 2K. No, I'm pretty sure we had a Mirror. Can somebody push a link to Mirror in the Discord, please? I thought we had that. I do apologize because we've had him on the stream. We've we've got a command somewhere. Um, you, uh, well, at least I've got that. There you go. Got a got a link for that one. Um, now we've got a question in chat. If someone like my friend had never heard of it before, what does Steamworks do? Great question. Wow, that's a big question too. So it does all sorts of things. At the end of the day, Steam is a social network uh, for gamers, has all sorts of backend services. So depending on your game, it can do many different things for you. But uh, stats, achievements, those are the two most common of the two you would first think of. Uh, cloud storage, which is saving your files up on Steam's backend. Of course, there's Steam networking if you want to handle uh, P2P or even client server connections over Steam's backend. And then there's, you know, more advanced features like Steam Inventory, which can let you do microtransactions or in-game inventory systems, crafting systems, all sorts of crazy stuff. Do mostly code free, mostly. They come out at night, mostly. Now, what is what is mostly? Lloyd? So we, we try to do everything we can to help you with configurations and all in editor. But of course, Steam is a big complicated thing and your game is bespoke. So you will have some scripting in there most likely. But for example, if you wanna unlock an achievement using Steamworks V2 Complete, um, it's a scriptable object. So you just grab the scriptable object and you can use, for example, a Unity event to call its unlock function. So you can do that with a Unity UI button. If you're using something like Bolt, um, Bolt will just recognize it and you should have nodes and all for everything. If you're using something like uh, Playmaker or similar, it can call events and functions. So you should be able to do it code-free in most cases, most of the time. Of course, we can't say you can always do it code-free because there's always gonna be those cases where you do need to drop to the scripts. Now, are you using System Core for uh, Steamworks? Yes, so System Core is the basis of all of our bits and bobs. So everything is wrapped up in scriptable objects. Everything has access to game events. Everything runs with data variables. If you don't know what all those fun things are, you can go check out System Core. But in short, it's just a way of running all of your assets as scriptable objects so that you can reference them cross scene, cross object, and have a common platform that everything runs off of. And System Core, for those who don't know, is free and is also available over on GitHub as well if you want the latest version. Let um, me push a link to that in chat for you all because I'm lovely like that. And for you know those wondering what a scriptable object, what's the benefit of, of everything being a scriptable object? It's not just that. You've got your lovely scriptable object event system that you've got on there as well, which uh, which is fantastic. Yeah, my two favorite parts of that system are the game events and the scriptable variables. So running it as a scriptable object, I'm sure everybody's familiar with uh, like the singleton model where you, you give everything a static variable and it, cross, it references over to itself. Uh, that's good and great, but it creates a dependency chain that can get really unwieldy. Scriptable objects can help you there by referencing through the scriptable object as opposed to creating singletons for everything. Um, and then, of course, the game event system. The idea there is that you can create your game or your events, such as, you know, open the help screen or close or start game. You can create those as objects in your asset database, like you would create a prefab or anything else. Uh, and then you can reference it in any scene. You can listen to it off of any scene. And this allows you to break the dependency between different objects. So now your, your gameplay scene is no longer dependent on your title scene, where if you were using a singleton model, it would be because the title scene would be where you initialize 
your singletons. And so you have to keep those singletons alive and the game scene has to be aware of them. Whereas if you use scriptable objects, it only needs to be aware of the scriptable object. The scriptable object is effectively just a common reference point. And because it's part of your asset database, it's always there. You don't have to worry about the load order and has it initialized yet and all that fun stuff uh, because it's a ref in your asset database. Now, we've uh, got a question asking, what about your video tutorials? Um, what happened to them? Have they disappeared or, or what's the deal? We're working with uh, Code Steel is his name. So, so uh, we're not the greatest at doing video work. So we wanted to raise the quality level on that. So we're trying to find other personalities to help us create the, the tutorials and all for Steamworks V2. Code Steel has started working on them, but they're not released yet. Has been of a bit of a slow road to get those out. Uh, my computer just told me to restart. No, postpone. We're not restarting. How rude. <laughs> it's, it's great, isn't it? Middle, middle of an interview, and then my machine just decides to do a Windows update. Uh, Leon says, I'm working with game events as we speak. It turns out it's a necess necessity if you move to splitting a scene up in additive layers. Uh, yes, it is. I made a wonderful app for work, actually, um, and the wonderful world of uh, scriptable object events, like like Lone is saying, just changed my life completely. Uh, which, actually, um, I need to refactor a lot of what I did in Mux um, to take advantage of all that again, because um, it has scriptable object events in Mux, but um, not enough. Naughty boy. Naughty, naughty, messy, smack on the wrist. Uh, once you get started with system core, it does it become addictive? Because as you say, everything you do is system core driven now. Yeah, so we use system core as the foundation for everything. Uh, and we do that so there's a common framework so that any dev that grabs a hold of any of our pieces can understand the, the basic level that everything can be built on top of. Um, but yeah, you, I suppose you could take anything to the extreme. <laughs> Balance in all things. <laughs> Maybe don't make every single variable in your game a scriptable object, though that is possible. It's probably not the best way to go. That is true. Uh, Iris John won last time. Yes, he did. Um, and Iris John had just actually was working um, with his game using Photon. And since winning uh, Steamworks, he ported his entire game over to Mirror. And since then, is now a, a Mirror fanboy and won't stop uh singing mirrors praises and telling me that i should move my projects over to mirror too now when you came on before you were saying that steamworks is not just a, a mirror at all though so for, the, for those who do it, it works with mirror but you're not just restricted to it yeah no not at all and we've actually since then we've added ml api transports as well and we're looking at adding mirage transports and i think we're also looking at adding uh forge transports Wow. So that would give us support for four different networking APIs. Now At the moment, we have the two. You've uh, I've got to find it here in core features. Now I keep on scrolling for 20 minutes and I'll get to the end of it. Do you want to share your screen? Well, you're sharing your screen. Shall we, shall we pop over to your shared screen? Sure. You're not, you're not showing anything uh, that's going to get us in trouble. So. Yeah, no, all, all my plans for world domination are on a different, <laughs> different monitor. Good. Uh, hang on. That's... That's not that one. Let me. That's my Steamworks one. I've actually put Steamworks into a project as well, just in case everything stopped working. Um, wow. Actually, tell you what, Zoom. Because we're using we're using Zoom, everybody. We're using Zoom. Uh, our Zooms seem to have taken over my monitor as well. Here That's we nice of it. Yeah. Good old Zoom. Love Zoom. I have a love hate relationship with it. I've actually told people at work, don't call me on a Zoom. Don't, do not do a Zoom call. All right, so your, uh, the only other Zoom call I've had to do recently was the um, residence thing that I had to do, because uh, that was on a Zoom call. So feel feel honored that I am sacrificing my Zoom ethics for you, buddy. I, I'm the same way. I do not like to use it, but I have a ridiculously wide monitor. So it's, uh, it's the, the easiest thing I could think of that has a share rec option. Well, we've got it now. We're live. Everyone can see uh, 
and you've got your uh, even engineering knowledge base. Obviously. Yeah, so um, part of the, so the, the V2 thing doesn't just stop at Steamworks, though that's the first first horse out the gate because that's our, our big stallion leads the show. But we are running through and we are updating everything in Heathen uh, wow. to a new version. Part of that is our documentation because that's our, our weakest point oh, traditionally. Let me, let me put my glasses on. Could you be so kind and do that control mouse wheel zoomy zoomy, Joy? Lovely. That's better. Sorry, I am getting old. Lockdown has, has made me a little bit more blinder than normal. Thank you, mate. Now I can see. So you've got a massive arsenal of stuff. So how is that? So is everything going to get v 2 That's the plan. Uh, so we're running through our entire library of all of our assets. We're also looking uh, beyond our assets. So you may not know, but we do consulting work and things like that. It's always been a, if you know us, you can call us kind of thing. Uh, but we are starting to productize that as well. Um, all of our Unity assets, of course, are getting V2 upgrades. So UIX is that'll be the next one that gets in its update. It's already in preview if you're on our Patreon site. Um, so it'll be released, I'm guessing, the next month or so. Wow. FizzKit has a V2 that's in design at the moment. Blockchain Game SDK won't get a V2 because it's new as of this generation. And we have new artists on board and we're starting to release some art assets, oh, proper wow. artists. So the previous art assets, don't hold that against them. That was programmer art for myself and all as I was starting to learn it on, on my own. Uh, some little breakable boxes and things like that. I, I was pleased with it and proud, with it, proud of it. But uh, the artists we have on board are much more talented than I and are able to do much more interesting things. So we have some new stuff coming out from them uh, soon. But of course, Steamworks is our, our star of the show. That's That's the biggest one. So just before we delve into the Steamworks, do you want to explain in a in a uh, elevator pitch the blockchain? Because um, I, I, if you go over to the website, you'll, it's all NF, it says all this NFT stuff, which scared me off. But then <laughs> uh, it's not just those. I'll leave it to you to to explain to ignorant me what it is that we're looking at. Yeah. So blockchain is a a fun game topic for 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 devs for game devs. Most people think of blockchain as being cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and all that. And yeah, you can do that. But for games, it opens up incredible worlds. So for example, uh, the, the example I like to give, because it's something I would love to do in a game uh, when we had the opportunity to do so. If you imagine your characters running around, it's an RPG, you're fighting with your, your plain little Jane iron sword that you got, you, you kill some orcs, uh, and that's great. And you get a new sword, so you sell off your iron sword. Uh, another player ends up picking up that iron sword and you keep going. Uh, you kill the orc king or what have you. That old iron sword that the other player now has knows that you killed the, the orc king after having already gotten rid of it. So now it can level up. And what I'm getting at here is persistent history. Because blockchain is a distributed database and that iron sword can be an NFT that it can actually exist outside of your game, it persists beyond the ownership of the player and even beyond a particular game. So that iron sword can be taken into another game, so on and so forth. There's so many opportunities that uh, blockchain opens up for interesting game design that has nothing at all to do with monetization. Um, and we're starting to see some technologies pop up that allow game developers to exploit that. One of them we've partnered with is Arcane Networking or Arcane Network. They have a, an API which kind of abstracts out the complexities of working with a blockchain. And we've integrated that with Unity. So it's all open source. You can, if you go to our KB article, I'm sure you'll get a link. Uh, the installation there will, will guide you to, to download it. The foundation's open source. So you can get started with it. You can start chatting with, with Arcane Network uh, and start looking into blockchain to accelerate your games. Uh, if you're already a Steam developer and you have an idea of what Steam inventory is, blockchain is a bit like that, only not specific to your game. It's, it, you can do a multiverse with that. It's, it's uh, another company whose name slips me at the moment, who's doing a whole multiverse concept with uh, with blockchain technology and video games. So, is, I mean, the key part of that is, like you said, it's beyond monetization. So when you hear blockchain or NFT, and so I just think of, uh, oh, more ways to um, basically steal money out of people. Uh, yeah, see, personally, I don't like doing monetization with blockchain for a number of reasons. I mean, my engineer had on, I hate the idea of blockchain for the use of money. 
because it's unstable and undefined. So I'm always thinking of safety and security first, and it's just not there. Uh, but for broader concepts in game design, like persistent immutable history of items, using smart contracts to allow players to do you know, bounties and quests and whatnot between each other. There are so many opportunities that have nothing to do with eking money out of people. It just allows the game developer, the game designer to exploit the fact that a blockchain is effectively a database that's distributed around the world. Uh, it can't be hacked, not because it's super secure, but because everybody has a copy and an algorithm can confirm the validity of any given transaction at any given time. Yes, it can be a bit slower, but that has been improved on over and over. And technologies like what uh, Arcane Network, the Matic chain and things like that are working on that are keeping the rates low. So the cost of performing those transactions, very, very low. It's down to fractions of a USD penny at this point to perform NFT style transactions. So the all the, the roads are starting to converge that would allow game designers to do some really cool stuff with... Uh, with blockchain backed games that doesn't have to do with, you know, gotcha mechanics or, or whatnot. Well, you've actually made me excited about blockchain, which is uh, something that doesn't happen. So kudos, well done to that. Uh, and talking about um, open source and all that shenanigans, Wizards Stone Co just walked in just in time. Hey, Wizards, we're just talking about open source and uh, in, and your ears must have been burning and here you, and here you come. Just, we're going to play about with, with Steamworks. Um, and you did mention that a new version of the physics kit will be coming out soon. Uh, Jeffrey's just asking, what's the biggest change in the version 2 of the physics kit? Uh, this kit? So all of our assets are getting um, a restructure. And as we go look through Steamworks and how it's laid out now, you'll see some of those some of those changes. In particular, integrations between them. So um, FizzKit with Steamworks integrations or FizzKit with our art assets, um, a lot of quality of life pieces. So we're not trying to give you a, a single style of doing things. We're trying to give you the tools so you can Lego it together to build what you want. Some examples of that is uh, right now in the base version of FizzKit, the uh, physics bone, which is what does the, the dancing ladies that uh, mm -hmm. Messi likes so much. <laughs> So, so that kit um, is rather specific to the function of making chains of trees or chains of transforms bounce around simulating uh, a springy like material. We're changing that to be a physics actor, physics receivers, and these low level pieces, which can then be strung together to do lots of different things. And we're gonna keep it simple as we've done with Steamworks and we're actually making it a bit simpler. So if you don't wanna dive deep, if you don't want to hook it up to, you know, do moving grass, which is something you can do with the current one, but it's kind of outside the, the box. You can just drag and drop and go from there, but you can also be a bit more piecemeal with it. Uh, force fields, magnetics, all can work off these same objects. And we're building all of that and extending our system core to include some common data objects in Unity. Uh, physics data is one of them. So regardless of the physics engine you're working with, there's certain pieces of physics data that's necessary to do things like quadratic drag calculations, buoyancy, uh, spring mechanics. And we can handle all that at a lower level, which will be a bit more efficient. It will mean different things can share the data. So you're not losing those clock cycles, recalculating it on different pieces. Let's say you've got uh, some dancing ladies that are dancing around on a floating boat uh, whose velocity is controlled by quadratic drag instead of calculating that basic physics data three times, it calculates it once. It's common to the system and shared across the three, uh, which lets you run much, much quicker. Wow. I like that. You had, you had me at hello. Um, right, let's then pop in to, to what we're playing about with right now because uh as people know it's on a 50 percent off the the complete one for version two and if you want to get it for free well you get the uh, foundation one for free on the exclamation mark steamworks in chat and if you download the uh the free one today i'll give you a 50 percent discount on version two while the sale is is running so are you you're going to show us what's different what what have you changed uh since we we had a chat and played about with version one well from a code and project point of view basically everything 
Wow. So more or less a complete rewrite. So the, we went through and just at a, a high, high level, we went through and we wanted to simplify all the namespaces because we would really like you to be able to discover things as you go without needing to learn the intricacies of Steam API. Our original V1 was based very much so off of Valve's interface design. So you had a friend system, you had networking, you had all these different pieces. And over the life of V1, we started massaging those down to a handful of them. So you had lobby manager, foundation uh, manager, uh, a couple other, you had three or four different managers. We've now unified all that into a single system. You now just have the main. So uh, if we pop over here and look, you just have Steamworks behavior and that's it. That controls all of the systems. All of that's driven through Steam settings and the Steam settings object can now handle all the different pieces in a single config file. That config file is smart. You don't have to worry about it wasting space. If you're not using a thing, then it's not got it in the loop. If you're running on foundation as opposed to complete, uh, not everything will be in there. So it's conditionally compiled. It also handles the concepts of client versus server. So it will strip out server code and, or and a client build and it'll strip out client code in a server build. Uh, and all your scriptable objects are still there, but you no longer have to create them separately uh, because we're trying to simplify that initial getting started piece. So you'll notice underneath my settings, that's where we find my achievements, my DLC objects, all of that as a child of the Steam settings object. So you can still drag and drop just as you did before. It's just now when you want to create a new stat, you just click the button to create a new stat, you name it, and that's that. Uh, whereas before you would, you know, right click, create, go to Steamworks, go find the thing you want to create and create it that way. So simplifying the interface for the designer, that's been an important piece for us. And then also the developer. If we pop over to Visual Studios, um, we've been real keen on structuring our assembly. So before we had a number of different namespaces. And again, we were, we were kind of guided by initially what valve had set out with their different interfaces and then we massaged those down we ended up with i think three or four of them at the time we had foundation player services game services and networking and then complete which set up over top of all that so you had five different namespaces that different things were in that's now all been unified into the steam api uh, and again this is for discoverability so if you were in a given script let's pop over to unity just real quick uh, and we'll just use the example stats update script so if I didn't necessarily know where something was or what I wanted to do, everything starts with Steam settings. So I would start typing Steam settings and I can hit period button and I can see the stuff that I have there. And right at the top, I have the common things to work with. You have achievements, you have the application and you have the client. So if you're doing something on the client, you choose the client. And then you go into the client and it's the same thing. Now you have the different systems that you can choose the different events that are appropriate to the, to the client. So you can simply explore inside Visual Studios via IntelliSense and find your way around for you know, software developers that are accustomed to that sort of life. Uh, part of that, we've also improved all of the inside code documentation and the structuring for that. So if you want to learn your way around the Steam API <clears throat> without using the knowledge base, uh, you know, using the object explorer, you can, and it populates the documentation uh, with the object you select, telling you through remarks and whatnot. We also have code samples in here and that will populate. So a lot of quality of life improvements for the designer over on the editor side and a lot of quality of life improvements for the, uh, the programmer as well. And one of the newer features that I, I quite like is our Steam Inspector. So one of the big challenges with V1 um, was understanding what was going on with all your Steam objects. Now, because we used scriptable objects, you could see a lot of that. Uh, but it limited you in that the objects had to conform to a single scriptable object. So in that old version, you could only manage a single Steam lobby. Uh, we had to cache and duplicate data so that it could be seen on the inspectors in that way. Uh, we didn't want to do that because it's not efficient. So th that gives more areas for things to break. So we created the Steam Inspector. And the Steam Inspector does just what it says it does. It inspects the state of the Steam API at runtime. So if I stop simulation, Everything goes to unknown and it doesn't know what's going on. Um, but if I hit play, Steam API will initialize. It'll pick up on all that data and start scraping out uh, what's been initialized and show me all the states for all that stuff. Uh, and that also works with lobbies, which let's go to a scene where I can join a lobby. And we can have a look at that. So lobbies is a 
an area where we've done a ton of work. Uh, let's see, where's my lobby scene? That's a lobby scene. And I'll just pop back into our inspector. Yeah, so it sees that I'm in one lobby. It's a normal type lobby. Um, this is the data uh, that it's found off of it. The metadata keys attached to it and all these are selectables. So you can copy and paste them into your chat with the rest of your dev team, so on and so forth. It's all about helping you with that debugging. And then of course, there's the new features. Uh, so new features would be things like multi-lobby. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that is, if you've played a game uh, like League of Legends or any type of social game, you've probably seen parties. So you can join a party with your friend or a group with your friends. And then you can also search for a lobby, which is a game match to join. And in Steam land, uh, that's multi-lobby. The game lobby is a public lobby or a normal lobby. And then the lobby with your friends is called an invisible lobby. And Valve's documentation is very obtuse on that. We think we've got that simplified down. <laughs> and made it much more understandable uh, with our lobby system and with our, our matchmaking system. And it's all just built on top of uh, you know, stock Steam. So if we can look at our, our shiny new documentation here under matchmaking. So the lobby system got its name changed to matchmaking tools. Since it's a bit of a misnomer to call it lobby and lobby can mean different things. It deals with more than that. Uh, but in here we talk about uh, you know handling multiple lobbies and how to work within there's code samples for everything. We are tracking that one normal lobby that Valve allows you to be a member of. And we track the first invisible lobby and we treat that as the group lobby. And then any additional, which should have only allowed to be one additional invisible lobby, that would be for your merge lobbies and things like that. And these tools are meant to help you with that. And then there's the, the realm of optimizations and whatnot, the uh, we made it better code that was done as well. I'm glad you explained that because I was going to ask you what, what 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 language is that? And then you, you've, explained, you've explained it, so I can even I can understand oh, that one. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, I love I'm loving your uh, knowledge base, your documentation. It's a work in progress, but I I think it's so much better than what we had previously. Yeah, um, I didn't want to say it. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> And you've got your, as you say, you're working with somebody who's, who's going to be making your, your new tutorial videos as well. Are they going to be covering um, just Steamworks or is it going to be co covering System Core as well? The intent is to use them for all of the above. Um, but of course, it's it's up to them. They are a separate group. Uh, so hopefully they'll, they'll go with us uh, on all of them. If not, we'll find another talented YouTube group to help us out with the others. That's lovely. Um, uh, Fizzy Matt. Hello, Fizzy Matt. You're just in time. Now, you mentioned before, and you got on the left-hand side, that you're supporting Mira, now Mirage and ML API. We had um, the... Uh, I refer to Ms. Tintin, uh, the creator of ML, of ML API. He is so young. He, he looks like he's 12, and he sounds so sweet. Such, such a lovely chat. Really was a lovely chat. If anyone check, catch it over on YouTube and on, on the Twitch, um, now, which what would you recommend um, for if somebody's getting started? He's he's hasn't yet begun coding at all, and he's got a blank canvas. Where would you recommend for them to 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 jump into? If you haven't been coding at all and you're starting in the game, I would recommend a single player game to begin with. But if you mean specifically, where would you start with networking? Yeah, I would aim likely at Mirror. It's the it's the oldest style out of all of them. And that's the reason I would start there because there's so much existing documentation and examples and community. It's the, uh, the devil that is known. It has its quirks and all and uh, Mirage is simply faster. It's built by the same team that does Mirror. ML API has been, uh, is being backed by Unity at this point. So I would expect it to surpass all the others uh, eventually, but in okay. terms of having its legs under it, Mirror is the veteran of the uh, those three. Of course, there's, there is the fear as soon as Unity put their hands on something, it's going to get deprecated um, and, 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 and put in a cupboard, a bit like Vault 2. And got yeah, killed that's, off. Uh, that, that, that is always the thing. Uh, and it is kind of funny since Mirror is based off of UNet, 
uh, which Unity deprecated before they released their next version. And ML API is not dissimilar. Uh, it, it does things in its own way. Um, but once you learn Mirror, or if you previously knew UNet, or if you find old UNet tutorials, you'll be able to migrate to Mirror. Once you understand Mirror, you'll be able to migrate to ML API. Mirage is a bit different yet still, but the mic once you picked up one migration to the other is not a big deal. Uh, and I think the easiest one to pick up is probably mirror, not necessarily because it's the simplest or anything like that, but because the community is ludicrous sized. It's very large. Um, it is, it was originally anyway, a true clone of UNet. It's kind of diverged from there, but a lot of the old UNet stuff is still applicable. So you've got years and years and years and years of documentation and examples and whatnot that you can work off of to get a grip around how it works. And then once you have that, sure, migrate to what makes sense for the project you're doing. As you get into it, you'll learn that there is no best solution. It really depends on your game, what your networking requirements are, the nature of your team, you going client server, uh, what sort of transport API are you, you planning on going with socket based or if you're doing something under Steam, then of course you're going to want to stick with something that is friendly with swapping out those networks. So what what's um, Mirage? Um, the, is it is this has this come out relatively recently? Um, what's what's the difference between that and the others? So before Mirage was called Mirage, it was called Mirror NG or something like that. It's basically Mirror Part Two. Uh, it's a complete re rewrite of that system um, by the same devs. I'm pretty sure it's the same devs anyway. It's just a lot cleaner, um, a lot more efficient. Instead of being copied off of UNet and trying to stay true to UNet, they've kind of cut a lot of that away, but they're keeping what works. It's still very much so a new beast. Uh, so if you're savvy and networking and you're happy to jump into that preview world, by all means, Mirage is a a very interesting prospect, and I'm sure it will be every bit as powerful as Mirror. But at the moment, it is still early days, so there, there's still some some growing pains there. We will be supporting it uh, because it is so similar to Mirror. If you support Mirror, you might as well support Mirage as well. The idea of the transport, the network manager, that's all doesn't work quite the same, but it's very, very similar to the point that one ports to the other nicely. Now, he's making what he made, released it, a dots based networking system as well would that be able to work have you, have you played about with it so to know if that if that would work with steamworks or is it, is it a completely different thing the steamworks transports should work with it but once you start getting into dots there's a lot more questions that pop up so unity's implementation of a uh, an ecs type system is still, I'm trying to find the, the, the nice way of wording it. <laughs> it's still very much so in a, uh, a design phase, let's say that, a, a preview or design phase. It's not very stable. So it changes from moment to moment. And the implementation is kooky uh, in certain spots at the moment. There are a lot of cool tools out there. I do know Viz2K, I think it was Viz2K. Pretty sure it was Viz2K was working on a dots, a pure dots uh, networking solution. Yeah, that's the one. And uh, Unity Tech, so I understand, is looking at doing something similar with ML API. So I understand, don't quote me on that one. Uh, when he came on uh, the stream, he um, kind of um, dropped a little bit of a chat that they're, they're separate in the two teams. So there's the ML APIs, the non-DOTS, the non-ECS, uh, and then the separate project is the is their ECS one. So, and, that's, and that's the type of thing that's gonna get you in trouble with yeah. Steamworks, right? Because Steamworks is already multi-process because the Steam API is actually running on the Steam client, not in your game. So you have to have a loop running to pick that up, which is fine. You could do it in pure dots environment, but it is a completely different beast. So I think you probably could do it in a hybrid model, uh, but it would be duct tape and bubble gum. <laughs> now, once, once dots is stable, he then has the general notion of if Unity calls it standard, then we should support it. Uh, so once Unity has dubbed it stable, uh, we will look at porting uh, a Steamworks dots over, and then that would certainly work for you. But in the meantime, I think it would be duct tape and bubblegum to make it work. 
uh, but I think it probably could work if you're you're savvy with it. There wouldn't be huge differences in the transport. The main problem is going to be that update loop. So um, when it when they say standard, so we're talking about 2025, uh, six weeks before they deprecate it. Um, now, qu question mm -hmm. in chat: uh, Is this basically photon? Um, good question. So um, what is uh, uh, what is the difference between using Steamworks and Steam to using a photon? Oh, that's kind of a loaded question. So uh, Photon um, is a back-end service provider and a networking provider. So they handle hosting, they have their own little networking API that they use, so a high-level API, and they provide some back-end services like routing, matchmaking, stuff, leaderboard, stuff like that. So there's crossover. Uh, Steam itself, just the Steam API, handles some things that, uh, that Photon does, matchmaking, leaderboards, accounts, routing, uh, they have network transports, things like that. Steam does not handle hosting your server, so uh, which Photon does. And Steam handles a bunch of stuff, of course, that Photon doesn't. So yes, there, there's there's crossover. No, they're not the same thing. Photon is all about being a tool to help you network your game and provide you kind of a full ecosystem to stand on in one spot, uh, and that's that. Uh, it is not part of Steam, so you're not limited to Steam. That's an advantage of it. Whereas Steam, you don't have to pay anything extra. It's not an additional service. That's its big advantage. They're going to take their 30%. That's effectively how they're getting paid. And it gives you a whole world of features beyond just networking. Networking and matchmaking is there, uh, but so is you know inventory, microtransactions, remote play, remote storage, voice, chat systems, achievements, stats, social networking features like friends and clans etc all of that is part of the steam api as well so like you're saying that the important thing is uh people to, to know that when you get your game on steam they're not giving you a free server to run your game on that people can join yeah exactly and there's no reason to think that you have to do one not the other uh i would say there's quite a few you know pun games that are on steam using the steam api and of course same would go the other way around. The same thing applies with uh, PlayFab. I would I would say that PlayFab and Photon are more direct competitors than Photon and Steam. Steam is a platform; it's a social network. The Steam API gives you the tools to work with that that tool, with the that platform, that social network. PlayFab and Photon are about being a backend service provider. They provide server hosting. They provide account management. They're multi-platform. Um, all that type of stuff, all that data operations kind of work, that's what they do. Whereas Steam is platform, so service provider and platform. So um, for those who, who like me, are uh, ignorant in Microsoft shenanigans uh, um, and PlayFab, when when did that come out? Do, should, should I start doing it, using it now? Um, should, I, should I jump? Into, into the PlayFab water and start swimming? Uh, personally, I like PlayFab, but of course I would. I'm an old enterprise software engineer, uh, and I've spent a very large portion of my professional life working on Microsoft tech. Uh, but PlayFab's not the only duck out there. There is PlayFab, there's GameLift, which is Amazon Web Services. I forget what Google calls theirs. Basically, all the big players have a system out there. In my opinion, PlayFab is the easier one to learn, but of course I would be skewed towards that as a Microsoft developer, uh, not from Microsoft a developer that's lived <laughs> his life in Microsoft tech. And I find PlayFab uh, to be very, very price friendly as far as indies go. You can run for free on PlayFab up to a certain limit. And that limit's actually pretty high. Uh, so there's some great opportunities around there for keeping your costs down, for being easy to use. There are examples and tutorials, use Mirror and Unity. So it's very easy to, to wow. get into that world. And, 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 and that means that I don't I have, don't have to worry about finding a, a separate service now to host my game servers. Yeah, no, hosting game servers, that is something I love. So a bit of background history on me. I've been in engineering for 20 some odd years. I've been the head of engineering at large enterprise companies. Uh, and most of that has been working with either gold partners or what we called uh, large enterprise. So P 
people like Microsoft, like uh, video gaming technology, VGT, uh, Ergo, systems like that. So I've worked in data operations. I know how much of a complete pain in the backside it is when you're dealing with scaling your servers out, you're managing different platforms, especially rolling out updates, just dealing with that massive headache. That's a full-time job. And as an indie, I didn't have time for it. So I was never interested in building a client server game uh, except for maybe on something like PlayFab uh, that would handle the hosting or not PlayFab, sorry, Game Portal or G Portal, where they were handling all that data operations. The problem was having them do that was very expensive. Multiplay, which Unity bought, is another example of a service that does that for you. But it's always been priced out of the indie range. They would say that it's not, but honestly, most of us as indies were one, two, maybe three guys if you're lucky, and your budget is whatever you didn't spend on beer and peanuts. Mm. Uh, so they were outside of the indie range. PlayFab, on the other hand, we've got a couple of projects up and running on PlayFab. We've put no money down into it. One of the projects I think we did run over on our server time and we had to pay 20 quid that month. Uh, so very, very indie friendly. Wow. I don't want to go in and sound like a, a Microsoft rep. So do go <laughs> look at their... They have pricing in here somewhere. Yeah, there's pricing. Uh, so go look at their pricing model. It's free to start. You can handle up to 100,000 users so long as you keep your, uh, you know, your clock times and all down to a reasonable rate. That does cover hosting a server and everything else. Uh, and the pay as you go, That's this is the reason I think they're indie friendly myself. Now, so, you, were, you were saying that um, they're more of a competitor to Voton than Steam are. So Steam being a social network. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, so you, is, is there, does that mean now that we've got um, Heathen Engineering as the glue sticking Steam and PlayFab together? Yeah, so we haven't built any tools around PlayFab, but we certainly could. Uh, PlayFab has a very easy to use game SDK, they call it. It's already built in and works with Unity. Um, you can use our Steam API with that. So they'll, they'll play nicely together. That would be PlayFab handling your accounts, your server hosting, scaling, all that fun type of stuff, and Steam doing all the rest of it. And we've actually had this conversation quite a bit with some of our users on the Unity Asset Server. So it's a common enough question. I, I've got a multiplayer game. I want to get it out there. Can Steam do it all for free? And you know, Valve doesn't do hosting, so no, you can't do it all for free but there are services like PlayFab. And so they start going down the road of looking at PlayFab or GameLift. Heathen Engineering is biased towards PlayFab, but we have plenty of our clients that use GameLift, which is Amazon, uh, and a couple that use Google, whose name I keep forgetting, BlueStack, something like that. At any rate, any of those services, you can look at those and you would want to use Steam everywhere where it can because Steam is effectively free for you as a game developer. You're already, you're gonna pay Valve that 30%, that pound of flesh. Uh, whether you like it or not. So use all of their services. Use Valve for your leaderboards, your stats, achievements, cloud storage, for user accounts, authentication, for matchmaking, for lobbies, for all of that, use Steam. And that keeps your PlayFab bill or your GameLift bill or whatever else down low. You're just using them for data operations, for spinning your servers up, for uh, if you want to do something beyond accounts, you can. And one of our projects, we're also using their cloud scripting. So if you remember our last talk around Steam, Steam Inventory, we were, we were all excited about it at the time because we had just recently implemented it. Uh, so Steam Inventory lets you generate items for your players and they can trade with each other. You can do a microtransaction if you want, but you don't have to hook it up to money at all if you don't like. You can keep it as just a crafting system and a, a player market system and an inventory system, but it is secure. Uh, so you're limited on what sorts of things you can do if you don't have a trusted server. PlayFab and GameLift and all of them, they are trusted servers. So you provide your key, you hook it up, you can run your scripts through PlayFab or GameLift or whatever else, uh, cloud scripting, and that way you can handle those trusted transactions on Steam's backend with a very minimal operations cost to you as an indie dev. So how much, I mean, obviously we're going to be chatting a lot about Steam, because uh, Steamworks is currently 50% off on the Unity Asset Store for version 2. If you type in uh, Steamworks in chat, you can also get it for free, the foundation version, for those who don't know yet. Um, 
keeping uh, that was the key thing like keeping your costs low mm -hmm. um now how much of a difference is that really when you when you start offsetting all of the uh the inventory the the matchmaking the the storage and stuff with with steam how much how much percentage wise would you would you reckon you're you're shaving off from your your bill in your in your experience now with things like um PayPal? So if you're going pure uh, Steamworks, no backend service provider at all, then you effectively have an operations cost of zero because Steam is providing for everything. Yeah. As a consequence, you do have some limitations because you don't have a secure server, right? So you can still use Steam inventory. You just can't do things like generate a specific item for a specific player at a specific time because you don't have a machine that can say this player is allowed to have that. Uh, instead, you use playtime generators and things like that. So you can work around it, but there are limitations. If you want to shed that limitation and go over... Uh, to having a trusted backend provider like a PlayFab or a GameLift. This is GameLift site that I have up here. Uh, if you want to use PlayFab or a GameLift for a very small game under 100,000 uh, users, uh, which in the indie world, that's actually a pretty big game. But by PlayFab's definition, that's a small game. If you're under 100,000 users and you're under a certain number of transactions, you can look at their pricing schedule here. It doesn't cost you anything extra you're probably going to hit a few reads and writes. So you're looking at 10, 20 quid a month for something small. Wow. But remember, that's, that's going to help you with revenue quite a bit. And that's not with doing microtransaction. If you do microtransactions, that's that's your own thing. <laughs> um, I try not to get into that world. But you, the reason it will help you... You sold your soul to the devil if you do the microtransactions and your loot, loot crates. How dare you? The reason it helps you out with uh, making revenue for your game without using microtransactions, those features help with your player engagement with your game. Yeah. And inventory in particular, if your game suits having an inventory, suits having items, letting your, your players trade items with each other outside of game, uh, generating... So one of the things that I like quite a bit, uh, I'm not usually a big MOBA player or anything, but Defense of the Ancients, Dota 2, they did a, a new player experience and I went and reviewed it to see what all they did. I really liked how they did their tutorial. They effectively did it as a quest system. So you have a quest to go look at this menu or look at that menu or go do this thing in the game. Uh, and they give you a reward for doing it. They hook that up through their inventory system. You can do the same sort of thing. I thought that was a brilliant way of engaging a player, giving them something that makes their gameplay experience better, something they can use in game. And then also giving them things that they can interact with the wider game network around your game. So their friends that are playing the game or not just their friends, just the entire Steam marketplace. If you want to allow them to market the items, you can make a bit of extra money there. So if you allow the players to sell iron swords to each other, not microtransactions, you generate them in game, you find them in game, but then they can sell them to their buddies over the marketplace. You get a cut of that. That's how Valve Marketplace works. You can prevent that if you want to be a purist and not allow any of the real money BS, it's easy enough to do, but it all requires a trusted server. Uh, well, you can do it without a trusted server, but to really do that sort of deep integration and that player engagement where you're able to reward them with specific items at specific times, especially with like events, like a Halloween event comes up and you want to give them a pumpkin hat for doing some, for playing 10 games uh, during the October season. So you give them a pumpkin head. To do that, you need to have a trusted backend to do that. And that's where something like PlayFab or AWS would come with, come in. And yeah, it might cost you a few bob. If you've got a, a wildly popular game, it can go up. But of course, if you've got a wildly popular game, you should be able to afford, I mean, the, the 100 a month gets you a ton of active users. I have to look into it. Again, I don't want to get stuck into being their, uh, their sales <laughs> rep, but it, it gets you 20 million events uh, 60 million reads, 30 million writes, scaled way above what your typical indie user would have to bother with. And you can then scale that back down. That's the reason we like this one over like AWS. You get into a contract with Amazon, uh, at least whenever we've talked to them, there were contracts involved. So we just, we noped out of that. Uh, we, we don't like the idea of having an operations cost, but the pay as you go, the free to start. And if fates be with you and the game is running brilliantly, and you need to scale up, you can scale up and save money. So this 100 a month is cheaper than if you did pay as you go for the same amount of work. So it's basically buying a block.
Uh, and then if you go over that hundred, it doesn't cap off your players like it would with like game sparks or something. Instead, you get the standard plan, which is a bucket of stuff. It's uh, 20 million events. When you go over the 20 million events, it's 660 per event after that. Uh, well, actually, if you're paying for that one, it's six quid uh, per million after that for PlayStream. PlayStream, you probably wouldn't use PlayStream. It's for parties and all, but your, your read and writes, your storage, these are the ones that you would use for uh, like player services. If you're doing uh, cloud script, you get 400,000 gigabytes uh, with fractions of a penny per, you get a million executions. So it's, it's very light on the pocket in our experience, but your, your mileage will vary. I am not a Microsoft rep. Full disclaimers. <laughs> no, we allegedly. Do, we do have a Microsoft uh, employee in the chat. Uh, actually, uh, always it's uh, said like uh, disclosure. I work for Microsoft, um, so I don't normally say this, but you folks should check, should look at MS Game Tech. Uh, I don't know what MS Game. What is Game Tech? I don't recognize the term myself. Wiz wizards. What is what is this? What is this? Microsoft's Game Tech. Um, now, for those who are wondering. Uh, Game tech in general, game tech in general. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'll agree with that statement. I do. But like I said, I'm biased towards that uh, because I come from that world in my previous professional life. I'm biased towards Microsoft stack. I personally find them very easy to work with. Uh, and the, the technology is very easy to work with. And they hire wonderful people like Wizards Don't Code to work for them who are um, Linux um, open source uh, advocates working uh, for Microsoft, which is which is a bizarre, a bizarre thing indeed. Um, no playmaker support. Well, actually, um, Steamworks. You, you mentioned earlier about um, Bolt, but um, on also a playmaker. So, um, if you, if somebody's made their game with Playmaker uh, and they and they want to get you Steamworks to get over on, onto Steam, is it all straightforward for them? So depending on their skill or their experience with working with Playmaker and all, so yes, in the respect that we do everything as standard Microsoft, or Microsoft objects, Unity objects, uh, scriptable objects, we make all of our events friendly to Unity events, and that's what uh, Playmaker uses to drive its functions and all. So yes, you can use a Playmaker action, I think they call it, uh, to call like the unlock function on an achievement. And that should be very straightforward. But we don't we don't have a third party direct integration with them. We've looked at it a few times, but it's a moving target. And then, of course, Unity's got Bolt. Uh, if if Unity's going to eat their lunch, then it doesn't make sense for us to invest there. But uh, Playmaker, there's another one too. Game Maker, I think, is one. Our community does. And so I know our community has built a few custom actions and things like that uh, around Game Maker and I think Playmaker as well. I've just loaded up. Uh for myself um unity i just opened it now if i was to if i've got my game basically i've made a i've made a single player game mm -hmm. do i need to basically start from scratch now to get it multiplayer ready using steamworks exclamation mark steamworks in chat um or 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 can i use this as an opportunity to port my single player game over most of that work is going to depend on what you use for your high level API. So if you go with mirror, it should be relatively straightforward, depending on the nature of your game, of course. But if you're talking about moving a, an avatar on the screen or something, it shouldn't be too much more complicated than adding a uh, network transform to the object and setting up your, your game network structure. So there's going to be a little bit of work there, depending on the, the API that you use. As far as the Steam side is concerned, it's one, one component, and that's just the transport. So picking your, your API, let's say you use mirror, then you would use our uh, Steam mirror transport and and then you're done. So there's no extra work that you need to do beyond what you would do with raw mirror anyway. But mirror is, those those are the network guys. We don't try to steal their thunder with that. We simply integrate with them. So it's really a question of which API you want to use. Now I've played about, uh, we've had, We've been lucky to have uh, Mr. Punfish himself in chat. First Gear Games. First Gear Games does wonderful uh, tutorials on YouTube. Uh, let me stick a link in his in the. There we go. So he does tutorials on on Mirror, 
how to get started on Miro, how to make a lobby, how to do a, a, a Miro for your project, and also ML API as well. He started playing about with uh, using that. But he's got his own uh, fixes that he made. If you're a patron of of Mr. Uh, First Game G Games, Punfish, he's got uh, fixes where um, if anyone watched my video when I was making GTA, uh, made multiplayer GTA, but I was using Photon, uh, Pun 2, if somebody was in the car and driving with a passenger in the car, then the passenger was floating outside of the car. It was quite a magical experience and he's got his own fixes for that uh we're using mirror where it resolves those kind of problems if people are basically making their own uh add-ons or, or changes to mirror would mm -hmm. that still be compatible with steamworks or would that are you only supporting the uh out of the box standard mirror from the from the github or no, you can you can use anything you want our only touch point is the transport itself Oh, cool. So all of all of the fixes that he's done for all of my physics head, head, uh, headaches and stuff, um, then then I don't have to, to worry about, oh, no, I, I, I can't use that with Steamworks. I can still use it. Yep. Brilliant. I said, that's that's my own. That's my personal question for the night, uh, <laughs> because the standard mirror uh, also has a problem with if your passenger's in the car, he's floating about. But we have uh, First Gear Games' little uh, mirror pack. You don't have to worry about that. And he's also making Fishnet. Exactly. EF Dome. He's making his own uh, alternative to MLEPI and mirror called Fishnet, which would be interesting. Now, you must get a lot of requests to get more and more things working with Steamworks. Do you draw... Is, is there a limit, that you're, a line that you're drawing in the sand when it comes to what you're going to be compatible with we don't want to do anything and we don't want to have to try to build compatibility for anything that would skew the way uh steamworks works so we don't we don't want to make it specific to it i thought you were going to send the sentence we don't want to do anything full stop <laughs> no quite quite the opposite we we want to support as many things as possible um but there are a few places where we can't so we've been asked a couple times to integrate with like Photon's concept of a room. Yeah. But Photon does some weird stuff and it would have to be rather specific. We, we'd have to make a number of things rather specific to Photon. So that's not really a viable use case. Uh, same thing with Playmaker. The reason we don't directly integrate with it is there's Playmaker, there's Game Maker, there's Bolt. So we would have to pick and, and choose our integration points and pick one. And if we're gonna do that, it's gonna be Unity's yeah. because Unity is the foundation of us. So um, it would be Bolt. The same thing with like the shader graphs. We have a whole set of shaders that we are working on update. We, we want to deprecate those. Those are old school legacy shaders, but we do want to bring those ideas over into the modern uh, engine and world. Shader graphs are the way things have gone. As much as I don't personally like them, I still prefer to write things in code, but fine. <laughs> and I, I love, I think it's Forge Shader Graph. That, that's the one that I like. I usually hate all Shader Graphs or Node Graph editors. Just full stop, I don't like WYSIWYG style programming. It's not for me. But the one that I do kind of like, I think it's called Forge. I, I tolerated that one. But still, that's, we're, that's, we're that's, porting our that's, shaders that's into good. Unity Shader Graph. It, that, that's that's, that's, that's a while ago now, mate. And uh, so much has changed. Uh, since you made Forge, uh, exclamation mark, um, 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 what, what is it? What, is, what did she, what is it called? Um, the, the, the liney thing. She was, Freya was on the stream. What is it called with the, the liney thing? The, with the, the squiggles that you can draw in, in, that's it, shapes. Thank you so much. I was going, you know, the shapes thing that you can draw the shapes. What did she call it? What does she call it? The thing with the shapes. Yes. <laughs> shapes. A black mage is going to going to bed. Black mage, it's not even one o'clock in the morning yet. You're not allowed to go to bed <laughs> yet, buddy. Thanks, Heaven, for all his work. And indeed. Thank you, Heaven. And for those who aren't aware, um, they've got a load of free stuff for if you if you're if you're umming and ahhing at this point. Uh, I would say Always drop down, have a look at System Core. It's free. It's also on GitHub if you're looking to get the latest version. And you can get Steamworks Foundation uh, for free. Uh, Foundation 1 and Foundation 
uh, SteamWorks 2. Now, uh, and also you can then get, if you're using one, you can get this uh, Space War demo as well. Uh, you can get the, 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 the long swords. Is this, are these your, did you, because you, you said that you were teaching yourself how to do the art. Yep. Yep, those are mine. Now, we played about with these uh, when you were on before, because I, I remember your modular weapons. I was very impressed with your modular swords. It was like a Kingdom Come Deliverance style thing. Yeah, I, I modeled after uh, physical, real swords. I mean, there is no standard long sword, for example, but there are rough averages, so they're all roughly correct for what they would be. So that's why they look pretty decent. Uh, it's hard to get wrong what was done before you. But yeah. our artists that we have on board will make those look even better. So Armory is going to get a full revamp from our wow. artist as well. Uh, we have been working on another project at the moment, uh, Cookery. We, we really like the idea of bash kits. Um, well, I really like the idea of bash kits. As a programmer who is who enjoys art, I'm a huge fan of it, but I don't have a crap ton of experience at it. <laughs> I need bash kits to help me you know, get my ideas across to visualize things. And if you don't know what a bash kit is, it's basically a bunch of pieces and parts that you can mush together, you can bash together to create something bespoke uh, that's yours but that you didn't have to create from, you know, blank canvas, nothing. And that's the idea of a bash kit. So we're wanting to do bash kits around the common things uh, that people like myself would need to prototype their game, to get the idea out there, or to create production ready artwork, but just not from, you know, plain scratch. So we're doing like, we want to do cookery. So pots and pans and stoves and things like that uh the armory so you've got swords and knives and weapons we want to expand beyond medieval stuff as well with you know guns and helmets just those commonplace things that they, they kind of fill in the world not your big show pieces but they kind of fill in the world to help out uh developers who are prototyping crates and boxes i, I forgot about those but that's a, I, I that's love, a prime example crates of, yeah. boxes. Yeah, that's, that's a prime example of types of things that we want to do a crate is crate. A barrel is a barrel. Yeah, there's different style to it, and you can take those and you can oh, modify them. Hold on, hold on. A crate is great. That's the catchphrase, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't resist myself. <laughs> and then we add the heathen touch to it, of course. So, uh, so everything's a scriptable object. Not always a scriptable <laughs> object, but everything has some system or logic behind it if you want. So like the crates, they have closing and opening animations and they can shatter. Uh, we'll be doing the same thing with like the cookery. You can age and wither them. You can beat up the pots and pans. Um, we're creating them so that they can snap in. So you'll be able to use them with other tools that you might already have, like the, uh, the village kit and things like that. So it's all about creating it to physical scale and making sure the systems are easy to use all those little pet peeves that I have as a programmer that struggles to do art in a timely manner. Uh, those are the types of things we want to answer with our bash kits. Now, can I ask you why? Uh... Oh, it's a bone. Oh, okay. I was going to, I was going to ask why, why is the logo for the any bone kit something else, but no, it's a bone. It's a bone. It's a, it, it's, it's a bone rotating. It, it, was, it was just my, uh, my immature mind had, saw something else in that in that logo I do, I do apologize i <laughs> i will go wash my eyes out with soap these are great i had no idea you did these exactly uh the little the little gems in the heathen engineer now amazingly Loden made these himself uh and um basically says that now he's got a real artist so it's gonna be even better i i love this stuff I really do. I think you did it. for someone who calls himself not an artist. I think you did a great job, mate. You should you should be very proud of, of what you did. Yeah, but you don't know how long it took me to do those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you haven't seen me coding of how long it gets me to do Hello World. Okay. Now, uh, important question: How long? How difficult it would it be for somebody to port their existing project over to um, System Core? Uh, not at all, because you can use as much or as little as you want. So you can import it in uh, and not have to change anything. It's technically there. So anything new you build, you can add to that. Um, and you can start swapping out things as you see fit. Some of the early things that I typically do, because I oftentimes, you know, 
dirty, nasty sandbox where I just go bang out some ideas. Mm. I don't bother to pull anything in. I'm just banging out something nasty right away. And then I want to start seeing, well, right, how would I do this? Uh, hooking it up to some other bits. So I might pull in some of our tools, Steamworks or whatever else. Uh, player health is one of the first things that I usually do because I'm setting up my UI and all. And you want the health bar to move when the player gets hit. That's the perfect type of thing to move over to a scriptable variable. You make the uh, scriptable variable, the player health, make it as a float or whatever suits you. And it has a change event on it. So now you can hook that change event up to your image fill so that when it's at 100, the image fills at full. And when it's at zero, it's at zero. And you can attach that to your damage script. You can attach it to anything else that needs player health. And that's the power of you know scriptable objects. You can use it as much or as little as you need. It just helps you glue all those disparate things together without having to create dependencies. I hate creating those hardwired dependencies like that because it costs you pain in the future. And you know it does. So it you, does. you go coding it up and you're like, all right, I need this information over there. I, I'll just public and I'll create a reference and oh no, that that's going to suck because that's now I've got a dependency there and if I got to change something that breaks 30 different things and that was six months ago. So I've done forgot what it does in the first place. And a better method is don't create that direct dependency, create an indirect. Uh, so create a script. It depends on what it is exactly, but player health, for example, don't make a reference to the player, make a reference to a float variable, scriptable variable, and then just use that. And the player happens to also use the same one happy days. But that way that script doesn't care what the player is or if there is a player or where that float comes from. It's just got a float that it's using to drive an image fill, for example. Now, what's the licensing uh, restrictions on this? Like, could I use a uh, system core for the foundation of my own assets and sell them on the asset store? Sure. It's it's full, full open source. I think we're set up with MIT... We went with the one that we thought was the most open and free to use. The Unity Asset Store, of course, always defaults to its own license, but we do have it noted in there that it is open source. And if you go to GitHub, you can get the code there. And I'm pretty sure it's listed under the MIT license. So it's effectively do what you like with it. So that, uh, what's, what's the one that the Unity Asset Store don't like? Somebody was I, explaining to me before. There's, there's one of those that Unity... Uh, scrunch their nose up at and cause people problems chat they, do you know which one is like they occasionally scrunch their nose up at all of them <laughs> uh, like we we've had to to go up against them a few times because we build on top of steamworks.net for example uh but if you talk with them i haven't found anything yet that they say no on oh, i wow. think they like money too much uh, and driving game developers to their asset store equals money for them. So they're, they're not going to say no, but they will make you do it in a particular way. So to note your licensing terms and things like that. It's probably CC0. That's probably the one that gets their goat. Uh, so that would be no commercial use. I can't see them tolerating that one just because they would have no way of regulating it and then they would be liable for it. But MIT, there's quite a few uh, assets that are out there on MIT. That's the one that uh, most of your open source is on these days. Oh, and lovely. then there's uh, copy left or something like that. That's another popular one. CC0 is popular with things like icons and all. Uh, Unity does not like that one. Why don't they like that one? See, it's public domain allows commercial use, wizard says. Oh, okay. I, I just know that they've copped off on that one because of some of its wording and them reselling it and then being the distribution point and then having to carry that license over. I just know that one's that one's caused a problem before. Apache license BSD. Is that what they don't like, Ninja? Okay. Well, uh, Loden, I'm going to have to uh, hook up with you to to because uh, I, I, as I say, I made my own. Uh, version as you know of uh, a scriptable um, object event uh, system um, but i don't have all of the sexy bells and whistles of your scriptable variables which are so so beautifully done um so i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to poke you repeatedly uh to go load 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 how do i how do i change how do i how do i do it how do i do it how do i change it how do i change it now you've got your discord are we, mm -hmm. Is that the best place to, to spam you with questions uh, or should people email you? Discord is the best. Uh, I'm, I've am i become worse and worse over the years with email. I mean, I still watch it, but it's become the, uh, if you sent me an email, you obviously don't want a quick response. Uh, Discord is for the, I would like a quick response, please. 
So yeah, use Discord. If you're wanting to build on top of uh, System Core, like I said, it's open source. So you can go that route as well. We would like to do more and more with System Core and we made it open source for a reason. We mean it to be the community's tool and framework. You can build paid assets off of it if you want to, it's completely fine. Uh, but if there's something that you needed to do differently, we can talk about that. And we, we just want to work as the shepherd that tries to prevent it from going off the rails. We're not trying to, you know, prevent you from doing things with it. Uh, Dan V. Cool says, I prefer regular mail with a wax stamp. That's my kind of guy. Yeah, the roll up scroll that's delivered yeah. by a footman. I've got um, owls that deliver my mail for me. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody in chat knows that reference. Now, um, how long do you know how long this sale is being get, is going to go on for? That we'll be able to get Steamworks for uh, version two for fifty percent off. I honestly do not know off the top of my head, and you would think I would since I'm a business contact, but a lot of times Unity sales are a bit of a surprise even for us. Uh, so, no, I don't know off the top of my head. Let me see if I can find out. I'm not sharing your screen, so you you can see whatever. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got a giant screen, so I've got stuff that's, uh, that's off on the side anyway. Don't show off with your giant screens. You know my wife won't allow me to get one. If if you got something big, you want to flaunt it. <laughs> so true. It is so true. Once again, my my wife won't let me get get one. Uh, <laughs> but I'm actually not seeing any notes in here on when it's supposed to end. Just them asking if we can be included, and we said yes. So I don't know, sadly. Oh my word! Um, now, a chat saying, uh, "What's the address so I can put it on my Rolodex?" Uh, the sale finishes June the sixteenth. Bitgamey says, "Thank you, Bitgamey." June the sixteenth. What day is it today? The fifth of June. What can you do on complete instead of foundation? Wonderful question. Uh, first, we could do what um, Adam from uh, Procedure Worlds uh, said. Uh, and what a few other publishers have said to me when I've asked those questions, go on the asset store and read it yourself. Why do you want me to read it to you? <laughs> but I'm very lazy, uh, and that's what I talk to people like even engineering for, so they can do it for me. What is the difference between the complete and the foundation loading, buddy? Ah, here I'll show you. So uh, if we pop over into the asset, oh, hang on. Let me uh, let me pop over to your screen now. Oh, what's my computer done now? Hang on, uh, and Zoom, there you go. Now when it says OBS is sharing Zoom, all it's doing is sharing my monitor. Now I thought it, I was actually managed to get it to share the Zoom screen, but no, it's my entire monitor. So if I put anything inappropriate on there, it's my fault, not yours. Sounds like fun, so we should try to get him to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so uh, at any rate, what you see is what you get in uh, in foundation as well they're, they're the same code base the only difference is the complete and player services folder so foundation comes with the framework which is achievements stats uh user data and the basics for friends and uh app data you, we also give you the network transforms so that's something that's new with uh, v2 versus v1 we do include the transports with foundation uh you don't have to get the complete version to get the transports oh, wow. That said, uh, matchmaking tools, user-generated content, which you probably know as Workshop, Steam Voice, Inventory, Game Server, all of that stuff is part of Complete or Player Services Clan, Authentication, Leaderboard, and Remote Storage. Those are the features that you would be paying for in the, the premium version, if you like, what we call Steamworks Complete. But the, the basics there, the stats, achievements, user data, and your networking transports, that's enough to get you off the ground, get you running. Um, Plenty of games, that's probably all they would use, at least in the early days of their development. You can do that with Foundation. Uh, Dan Vickers says, a better question would be, does the description of the complete include a list or comparison with what you get that's not included with the Foundation? Or is there a wiki or support site which that information is defined? So a simple uh, comparison. I think so. Let me, yeah, yeah, we do. There you go. So up on our knowledge base, um, we have them here as the little tick tick marks. We love a tick. Uh, 
I wouldn't say that's all inclusive because Steam API is absolutely friggin' huge. And are uh, they are they changing it very often to make your life hell? More often here as of late. So they've been doing a whole bunch of work around networking with Steam networking sockets and messages and a few other pieces there. And they've got absolutely everybody terrified that they're deprecating the Steam P2P networking and Steam game servers P2P networking. Um, I try to abate everybody's fears there by pointing out that, yes, they did mark it as deprecated. However, they also marked their original authentication system as deprecated like eight years ago, and it's still there and still works. Oh. So I wouldn't crap the bed or anything about them no. stealing stuff. It's not Valve's way to break old games. Because um, they've, Steam... they've got a load of games that would suddenly yeah, stop the, working. And... And we are seeing in the field that some games do great under Steam sockets. Other games don't do as well on sockets as they did with the original P2P networking. Some games support both at the moment. Our transport supports both. And actually right now there is a bug, not on our side, but with the Steam.net side, uh, with the Steam sockets where you will get a access violation error uh, running sockets. But not to worry, transport does still work. Uh, we support both of them, and it's just a little tick box. So uh, let's see if I can show you. I'm pretty sure I have a demo scene showing that one. We do love demo scenes, mate. Let's see. Do so you know what I love about Steamworks? You can't asset flip your demo scene. Yeah, no, it rips it all out. So they, they don't compile, and you wouldn't want to anyway, because we code these demo scenes to be verbose to to help you understand what we're doing. We do not code them to be, you know, production performant. Uh, so please don't use demo code in uh, a game scene. It just won't run well. Your game won't feel good, and that's not good for anybody. Nobody wants that. Right? Our transport. Where's everybody transport at? That's the network manager. There's the transport. Yeah, allow Steam Relay and use Steam sockets. So we have it turned off in the demos because, like I said, there's a bug at current with Steam Sockets uh, memory access violation error. Um, so that's that's all you have to do to turn it off using our transport. And just so everybody knows, our transports are not black magic. The full source is there. We do port them off of the, uh, the network provider's own transports. So in this case, the Steam Mirror transport is ported off of Fizzy. The ML API transport is ported off of, I forget who authored the original one, but ML APIs. Steam Transport and the Mirage one is ported off of theirs. Although I don't think we actually shipped the Mirage one just yet because Mirage is a little unstable. So point there being, if there's some feature you want to change or if you've got a patch from somebody else, you should just be able to plug and play it. What our port is doing is allowing it to work with our Steam behavior. Same thing with the custom network manager. That's a common question people ask is, do I have to use your custom network manager? No, you certainly do not. This is just something we write because we like to expose our events so that we can connect them up in the editor. The original purpose of this tool is to make it designer friendly and the stock mirror network manager does not expose those. You have to go into code to do them. So that's all our custom one does is it gives it a pretty little inspector with the toggles here and we expose the events. Other than that, it is a box standard network manager. It doesn't do anything fancy. Oh, nice. Now we had a chat last time about my my number one problem with steam is that i will i need to make games that my kids can play on that on their amazon kindle tablet to, together okay but then if i'm using steamworks that's that has to be on my windows machine doesn't it mm. is is there some is there something i can do so like some kind of emulation or some kind of hack that I can use Steam's uh, matchmaking leaderboard, all that social shenanigans, but also have my game on a, on a, on a tablet. You can multi-platform your game and our kit will strip itself out for you. So we wrap everything uh, in the Steam asset up. Let me find it. There it is. So we wrap all of that up in its own assembly and it will only compile for compatible platforms, Linux, Mac, uh, and Windows. So it'll strip itself out and you could build it out for multi-platform. As far as the social features go, there are some things you can do with Steam Web API, but you are gonna have some limitations there. Oh, like what? Well, I don't think actually Valve does it anymore, but back in the day, there used to be a link between PSN 
Sony's uh, PSN, PSN, and uh, Steam, to where you could pass through Authenticate, and you could do some cool stuff there. I'm pretty sure they've ripped that out since then. Because yeah. because everyone loves to be able to have your game on uh, players on on a, on a PlayStation or an Xbox, being able to play against players on a, on a PC. Yeah, so the way I would do that is I would use, if, if I was going to architect a game to do that, I would still be using Steam because if you're on PC, why you're not on Steam? Uh, it's just the general question. Um, but for the other platforms, I would probably, in your multiplayer at that point, right? I'm assuming, or you don't yeah. really care if they chat with each other. So if you're multiplayer, you're using something like PlayFab or AWS, and there's your link. So PlayFab, AWS, or sorry, Game Lift, whatever, that can function as your middleman. So Xbox, for example, has its own concept of uh, a network and an environment with friends and all that. And so does PlayStation and so does Steam, the PC world. So you can use PlayFab as your, your hub between all of them because PlayFab runs on all those different platforms. And PlayFab does have a concept of a player account. So you can link the Steam player account with it the Microsoft player account with it and the Sony player account with it and whatever other player accounts, Facebook or anything else, you can associate those all in that one place. And it's all GDPR friendly. Uh, it's Microsoft based. So it's, it's trustworthy from that point of view uh, or Amazon based. If you're going with game lift, I don't have anything against Google. I've just absolutely never used it or had to do much support. Oh, no, it, I've, so I've, I've, I've got things against Google. I don't mind saying that. As, as far as tech goes, tech <laughs> is tech. So <laughs> But PlayFab is the one I know the best. So yeah, it's it's quick and easy to hook all those different accounts up there. I, I know it's pretty similar for Game Lift, and I would expect the same behavior from uh, Google as well. Or um, Apple has a uh, a framework as well. I forget what it's called. Apple Play. So my 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 tech stack would be then uh, Mirror, because like you say, it's it's most common that i'm going to find helpful people to to give me guides on mm -hmm. uh so i'd be mirror steam with have we have heathen engineering steamworks currently 50 percent off exclamation mark steamworks in chat uh and then playfab and then i'll be able to get uh mummy and daddy sitting on the computer playing uh via steam on the desktop mm -hmm. and my kids on their tablets connecting uh, on on their on their Amazon Kindle tablets. Yep, and Chad down the street playing on an Xbox, and Bobby down the street playing on a PlayStation. Well, Sony is the one that's a wee bit of a prick about it. If you're going to do multi-platform support with Sony, you got to pay extra. Uh, but beyond that, yes, you can have all those platforms playing together, all using your backend service provider, your your operations provider, uh, whether it be PlayFab or GameLift or whatever else, as your hub and having those sync across to the others. So same thing with your game server. We have a game server built into our kit. So we help you with all that initialization and everything else. And do I have pretty documentation written up for that? I do in here somewhere. Quick start guide, Steam settings. I think it's the Steam settings guide. Configuration. Yeah, so the server configuration. So we can help you register your server as a steam game server that'll give it a, a steam id which will let your steam network connect to it using mirror you can use multiplex and so you can have kcp transport in there as well multiplexed with your steam uh, mirror transport that way your steam users are connecting to the server via uh, steam networking so they're not using ip address and port they're talking over steam's back end your uh, kids on the tablets and Chad down the street on the Xbox, because Chad's would play Xbox, not the PlayStation, is the, the joke there. <laughs> they would be connecting over through KCP, and KCP would be running through PlayFab's uh, discovery. So PlayFab has its own concept of a discovery system, uh, which can help you keep your players secure and protect against uh, DDoS and all the fun type of secure stuff that Ooh. you would expect from Steam. Nice. They can help there as well with the way they do things with the way they orchestrate things and everybody can be playing on the same single server that server would be integrated with steam so it would have a concept of the steam api and working with things and you'd have to code your game to understand that not all of your players are steam players so you would want to defer to the playfab concept of a user account and then check and see 
well, this user is linked with a Steam account, so they also have Steam stuff. So yeah, we can give them Steam inventory or whatever else. Or uh, no, this player isn't, but they are a, an Xbox player or a PlayStation player. So we can you know give them the PlayStation achievement or whatever else, as well as my in-game achievement, as well as the Steam achievement if they're also linked there. But you can use your PlayFab to orchestrate all of that. But that means that my, my PlayFab cards are going to go up more than if I was just on Steam, because then I wouldn't be able to offset everything else on Steam. Is that, is that right? It would depend on what features you want to use and what features your other platforms had. So uh, Sony and um, Xbox, micro, or Xbox, how was it called? Microsoft Live. There's a name for the platform for the uh, the platform of Xbox, which gives you your user. It has achievements and a couple other things. So those you wouldn't see it rack up as much because you're not storing that as part of PlayFab. That's part of that platform. Same thing with PlayStation and same thing with Steam. For the ones on the tablet, uh, that's running. I'm going to assume it's iOS or uh, Mac OS or OS X. Uh, so in that, uh, my my kids are only allowed to have Amazon Kindles because they're cheap. Okay, so in that case, there's to my knowledge, I haven't actually built for it, but to my knowledge, there isn't a backend provider there. So you would be using PlayFab to handle your achievements, and also in that case, yes, because you're storing more data. So if you go look at the pricing, and again, I don't want to get caught up as being their sales rep, but if you look at their pricing, um, they're cheap as chips. You've got storage in here somewhere. Now, what I need from Heathen Engineering is to take care of all of this headache for me, though. Because you're, you're already doing it for some projects and some of clients. Why isn't there a, a Heathen Engineering uh, PlayFab a, asset on, on, your, on your store or on the roadmap? Well, so far, there hasn't been demand for it. It's PlayFab does, does have its own plugins, which does quite nicely. But we wouldn't be opposed to that. And uh, you see these very important pieces down here. They're 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 under construction. They're coming soon. But these would help you with that sort of thing. Come on, chat. We need function. we need to spam him with demand. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a demand driven economy. Come on. <laughs> we need we need to, we need to. I demand it. Says we just don't code exactly. The Microsoft employees in chat demand it as well <laughs> as myself. Uh, now I. I'm obviously going to take advantage of, of, of how amazing uh, even engineer is and, I, and I'm going to spam them repeatedly with questions about how to get my assets ported over into using a uh, system called out. I, I want to be getting my assets that I'm making to be as user friendly for people who are doing multiplayer games as possible. So uh, taking advantage of this exclamation mark, Steamworks 50% sale off at the moment if you haven't already got it version two uh, let me know if any if i can help with any way there you go we're networking already wizards don't code in a wonderful uh romantic liaison with with heathen engineering it's a marriage made in heaven we can hook that up we can do it together with heathen's yep, he's definitely open to it you can pop over to our asset server and on there we have a uh, a dev talk section if there's features that you want you can recommend it there. Doesn't mean we'll guarantee we'll be able to do it, but letting us know what you would like to see. We are always looking to expand our systems, expand our integrations, and integrations are the types of things we do that we've always done well because that's our basis. So, and we like PlayFab. So I, I could see us doing a PlayFab integration in the future. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. Um, exclamation mark raffle we, uh, <laughs> no we don't have we don't have raffles okay i've just yet yeah, ef dome thank you for this sub oh dude thank you welcome don't forget to link your discord your discord your discord and your twitch so that you do get advantage of all of the wonderful uh, advantages of of being a, a sub uh, and the special subsection over on a discord uh, there you go now um it's it's already it's already midnight it's two minutes past midnight. How on earth did that happen? How did that happen? Uh, I, I, I can't. I can't. I can't even understand how that happened. Really, it happened last time we were chatting with Loden. That basically uh, the time just got away from us. We just constantly. I'm going to spam more links in chat for their Discord. Uh, so 
I'm I'm chatting with Loden Old over on Discord. Uh, I advise you to do it as well. Join their Discord. There you go. There's a link to their Discord, um, and also a link to their knowledge base. The beautiful new knowledge base from Even Engineer. There we go. Click onto that one. Uh, you've got two different links. Are they the same link for your Discord? Did I post the same one? No, they're different. Oh, <gasps> hold on. You got like two just multiple links jacked for uh, for for Discord. I hope, I hope one of them hasn't expired. Is there, there you go, no, chat. Chat, click on those. There are two different links to get in to even engineering's Discord section. So do that. And also while you're at it, exclamation mark Discord, join my one as well. Why not? Why not? We've gone past a thousand members on the Discord. Uh, I love the content and the interviews. Keep it up. Thank you, if don't. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed yourself today. Exclamation mark Discord. Thank you, Big Kami, for the Discord in there. Um, Loden, can I grab you then during the week to show you my thing, and and you can ask me, and I can ask you what you think of it, if if, uh, and 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 if it's big enough or how you could help improve it. Yeah, sounds great. Awesome, I really appreciate that. Um, now, I asked you a question earlier. I dropped you a Discord message. I'll leave it to you to read that. And uh, while I now also in chat, spam people with other amazing. By the way, here's the link to. Exclamation what he's already done. Show your thing, miss. I showed you all my thing last week. I always uploaded a video of it this week. Uh, <laughs> Mux. Messi's ultimate customization kit, it's called now. Uh, so you all can get mucky together. Because uh, I, I love coming up with stupid names that have got the word ultimate in. And those who have been around for a few years would, would get the joke. Uh, people who are relatively new will be like, he's a bit presumptuous, saying it's ultimate. No, it's not really ultimate. Dear God, man, nothing I could ever create would be ultimate. Things that people from Heaven Engineering would create would most definitely be able to have the ultimate tag applied to them because Heaven Engineering are amazing. And hopefully, very soon, this consulting page is empty, development page is empty, is going to be updated. Publishing, you're going to be a publishing arm for other people's games or just assets or anything. We actually already do a bit with uh, games and apps. So. Not mobile apps, not yet, though we wouldn't be opposed to that. But we also still do a good bit of work. Uh, people used to call them serious games. I never really liked that term. But <laughs> technology built on top of game tech, we still do quite a bit in that space around the enterprise area. And then, of course, games as well, because we have, over the years, developed relationships and contacts with uh, Valve, with GOG, places like that. So the idea there is to help, to be an indie-style publisher, not the... Uh, take a percentage of your company style publisher i like that now what happened with the gog uh you chatted about it last time that they that they are not yet on par with steam um is that are they making any 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 headway into into the to be a proper steam competitor with with their apis and stuff They've got a very interesting, you know, platform and store that they're they're working on building up. Which at the moment they're they're busy boys. Uh, you probably keep up with the game news a bit to see it there. Um, so we do keep chatting them up, try to see what's going on there. They are interested in doing uh, integrations. Now the main thing there is GOG is a curated store, so uh, where Steam is not Steam is Wild Wild West. Take that how you like, but really. They're key- yeah, they're, they're keen to not give people the idea that just anyone can can publish on uh, on on GOG. So it's 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 a bit like trying to get your your game on the Nintendo Switch and stuff. It's a, bit, a little bit more difficult than here's a hundred dollars. Now I can put my asset flip on your on your store. Exactly. Uh, it's a bit more like Steam used to be back in the day. Oh. So I would feel quite accomplished then if I got my game out on on, on GOG. I I wouldn't say it's just quality uh, because they they do like to pick up those indie gems and all. It's just a, it's really up to them. And that's the way Steam was as well, right? So it wasn't necessarily your game had to, you know, be AAA quality or whatever because they had tons of indie gems, but every game had to be personally reviewed uh, and approved, and changes might need to be made, et cetera, et cetera. And it prevented the shovelware and the flips and things like that. Because as we all know, if we've played video games on Steam, uh, <laughs> there's a crap ton of games. On there. there are, in the past few months, 
more games have shipped on Steam than I could remember being shipped in years previously. Yeah, that's not necessarily a bad thing. A, a large portion of those, I would say, are worth the time of day to go play. But there are certainly plenty out there that are just taking the piss. Well, they they was. Um thousands at one point do you remember there was, was literally thousands of games that got uploaded which were the exact same asset flip with slightly different names and artwork um and steam did take them down uh because it was it was it was controversy um at the time um and steam and i bet steam kept their kept their 100 quid per game i bet, I they, bet they did <laughs> they're very uh, friendly people but yeah i, I, I bet they did that's, uh, you got a lot of stuff on your publishing page. I'm having a look, and thank you, Chris, for the sub, and Lord Odwaysa for the subs. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, now you got you got a lot of stuff that you're that uh, made with Heaven. So these are these are stuff that are using uh, Steamworks or stuff that you're that you're publishing. They're all built with Steamworks. We help the devs out here and there with the publishing side. Like I said, it's not a traditional. Our name goes on it, not yours, so on and so forth. The idea is we provide you with those services, those bits of experience, those contacts, et cetera. Not the financial support that you would typically get from a publisher. If you need financial support, uh, we're probably in the same financial situation as you. We're a small <laughs> indie company. Uh, but we can help you out with getting your app set up on Steam, helping you test your app. So uh, we've set up a peer review system. Where right now, it's just driven through Patreon. But the idea is to pull the network in together to get them working with each other, the different devs, because that's a big area that indies have a hard time mm. with. You're a small team. It's understandable. You have your friends and family testing it, and then you ship your game, and you have a couple thousand people try out your game, and you get bad reviews because there were some bugs that slipped through. That's terribly unfortunate because it could be a great game otherwise. Just, just needed to leave it extra on the testing side, and all of us have to deal with that. That's something that comes with scale and an indie just can't scale. So the idea there is to use the fact that we are a community to, uh, to help out with that scaling aspect and heathens managing that for you. So you're not having to go out and manage that. We're creating the standard approaches to testing, the standard approaches to testing results or testing reports uh, and managing that whole transaction back and forth. I've put a link in chat if anyone wants to check out their Patreon page. Uh, it's easy to find anyway, just put either in engineering after the word patreon uh we'll stick it in the search and you'll be able to find them uh, and they start at one dollar a month plus vat uh going up to 25 uh, a month as well yeah, wanna... there's uh one on there that gets you access to all of our assets really yep the uh, premier perks all the perks of the premier supporter plus uh, plus more instant access get instant access to all heaven engineering unity packages aka our assets as they appear on the asset store oh my word but isn't that open to abuse somebody just giving you 25 bucks for one month and then downloading everything and then just running away but then yeah. i suppose they don't get the updates exactly they don't get the updates and while we do provide support for anybody that asks for it you don't get priority support if you don't have a paid license or, or aren't an active Patreon. So yes, you could pay 25 once, download everything and use that version. And that's that. If you want another update you pay 25 again, get another update, can't you? I suppose, well, it, I mean, it's a very, it's, well, I'm saying, it's, it's, it's very nice of you to, to offer that as a service, because as we all know, we, we've touched upon it. Uh, some people are in a harder financial situation than others, but still want to be able to have the opportunity to make their game's dream come true. Exactly. So that, yeah, that, that is, I've hats off to you. I actually, you know, you've just got a little bit of goosebumps there on my arm as I see that because, you know, it's, it's not often that you see in this day and age people give actively aware that they've given uh, loopholes into letting people get stuff at a bargain price but if you are wanting to pick up uh, a perma license then once again shameless plug uh steamworks is on 50 percent off over on the unity asset store buddy um i'm gonna oh if i if i just keep you on i'm never gonna let you go <laughs> uh but I'm, so so whereas i would now i would be like you know what i'm 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 going to bed uh but uh, and, and can I take this opportunity then to to show you 
uh, my thing in public, uh, if, if we do it that way, uh, and and then we can like see how how in a in a situation like uh, my project would we be able to take advantage of system uh, core and also Steamworks, uh, and then we can see a real world situ real life situation. How do you feel about that? Is that is that have you got an extra ten minutes? Yeah, let's go for it. Let's go for it, babies. All right, let me try and load up a project. So, uh, for those who already already have uh, some functionality in in uh, Mux of scriptable object event systems and stuff like that, as anyone who's played about with Messi's uh, Ultimate Input Manager or Messi's MIM, as it was known, uh, which is available for anyone who's a subscriber on the Twitch and you've linked your Discord and your Twitch together, go over to my Discord and you can download my MWIM for free uh, uh, and have a play with it. Uh, otherwise, um, you, you can't play with my MWIM unless you've given me uh, some of your, your money. Or if you've got Amazon Prime, you get a free sub. Use your Amazon Prime free sub. Uh, if you didn't know that, if, you're, if you've got Amazon Prime at home, you can subscribe to this Twitch channel for absolutely free. And it doesn't cost you any more money, but it gives me a plus one on the old uh, subscribers. So how do I share my screen on this Zoom? God, it's the word. Host disabled participant screen sharing. You know what? I'll share it with my with you on Discord. Um, I can see if I can fix it on here if you want. Uh, let's see. It says, that, okay. it says that you don't allow it, Loden. It says, it says, you won't let me show you what I've got. You're like, no, that's not appropriate. This is a family channel. We don't <laughs> do that. But this oh, is a heathen channel, and heathen channels certainly are inappropriate. <laughs> Why you got bouncing buttons? Oh, I love your bouncing button. I have to say, uh, this is one of my favorite videos. It's dedication to physics, right there. <laughs> What's the point of studying physics if you're not going to study the most important part of physics? <laughs> oh, it's inappropriate. Okay, so uh, let me know if you can see. Yeah, I see you there. All right, lovely. So let me uh, make sure everyone at home can see it as well. All right, here is here is Muck. So I've <laughs> I've 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 branched my Muck onto a separate Muck uh, Messi's own version control system, which is otherwise known as multiple folders on Messi's computers. Because uh, I I look, I started to use Git again, okay, and with all the best intentions in the world. I started to use Git again. And then all it takes is a couple of days of forgetting to do my pushes or whatever, uh, commit my things to the asylum. And then a week went by, or two weeks. And I was like, you know what? It's just pointless now if I push this. Uh, and then I went back to using my multiple folder uh, system, which has, got, it has bit me in the bottom a few times, I have to say. I, have I you have, looked at uh, Collab since you're if you're just using it as a small project, one man show kind yes. of project? Yes, I Collab am. Collab is easy to use with regards to that. The only downside to it is is once Collab's in there, it has to walk the entire directory. It drives me nuts that they do oh. that. But it makes the load time for the Unity project take a bit longer. Other than that, though, I mean it's backed by Git anyway. Uh, I personally am not a fan of Git. I miss the old TFS. Uh, Set that aside, though, that's an enterprise problem. Collab is a handy thing to use for, you know, little one-off, uh, one-man show. It doesn't do brilliant when you got a team working on it. For that, I would use Plastic SCM, I think it's called. Oh, is that expensive? Doesn't have to be, but yeah, it can get. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. Famous last words. Messi must use Git. No, I can't. Look, I just. <sighs> Git can get expensive, too, now. If you're if you're running as a company, and you're running repos and teams and everything else in an organization, it can get expensive too. Not as bad as plastic, but it also doesn't have the features plastic does. And I still I will never like Git's concept of forks and branches. And I, I, because I come from uh, you know Visual Source Safe era, and then over into TFS, it was just a, an SVN before that. See that subversion. Different... Subversion I can understand. All right, subversion. I I understood. All right, it took me a while, but I got used to it and I felt comfortable. Okay, conceptually, it took me a while to get my head around, but I felt comfortable with it. 
I just haven't been able to, like you say, we when we were doing a, a project together with, with Wizards Don't Code and Yolan for one of my game jams, even updating the my project to their forked thingamajig that they were doing, their branch or their working folder, whatever it was, uh, I I just I couldn't it was it wasn't working I, I I was having to delete things completely and build again and download the repo entirely from scratch every time there was a was a conflict I just I don't see how that's enjoyable whatsoever uh, whereas you know that's fine here we go so anyway I digress here we, we this I'm playing about with another. Uh, example of, of muck so now um let me let me show you a very simple use case which will be fantastic for a scriptable variable um so if i go to one of the demos here we go so here's a demo scene um oh my god and um zoom has got the big black bar at the top covering the play button from unity so let me stick you right down the bottom where yeah. do i stick you you're in my way little bugger okay moved it down there at the bottom uh all right so now i've got this scene now this scene's got a little scene manager in there uh and i've got uh thanks to uh yonder Lord games who who are uh, a neo exclamation mark neo fps in chat give me an exclamation mark neo fps in chat he 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 helped me improve my scene loader that now the select menu actually has the name of the scenes not just the numbers which i really appreciate uh, so all this job does it loads it finds my scriptable object profile manager is my profile manager uh, and then it, it loads it up by the way I hate 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 games that save in the app data okay <laughs> but I, I hate it but I know some people want it so I, I had to make this little tick box that will go okay fine you actively want to save in the amp data if you don't it will just save it in your um, save games of your of your current active user on windows um so so yeah oh my god i hate that anyway i don't rest again so i click play now and there's plenty of arguments to make to not save an app data at all oh just... app data is always on well it's not always on but in almost every situation your users will have it on C drive exactly. with their, with their windows operating system and you're filling it up with junk. It should be on what most users would have as their D drive or wherever they've installed or better yet, let them pick. Yeah, exactly. It's like, Oh, where's your, where's your game installed? Your game is installed on a dedicated hard drive. That's got loads of storage capacity for your games. Should that be where you've got your save, or should it be on your very small SSD that you've only got your operating system on? Oh, I wonder which one. Oh, God. And even sake. nowadays, it's even more so with NVMEs, super fast hard drives, super expensive. Most people, well, most people, the, the circle of friends that I hang out with we will install the games on the NVMe, not the operating system, because it doesn't need to be that fast, but just the games, not the saves move that crap over to remote storage and push it over into the commons folder on uh, Steam is how we go about it. Those those are those people who, who are, uh, I've seen them, you know, like getting the best of everything to make sure that there's not a single drop of latency anywhere. It's like, oh, come on. Yeah, it's, the, it's the joy of min-maxing your hardware. <laughs> exactly. Um, my mouse is so bad, it takes me 20 minutes for it to drag across the screen, by which time I've been shot dead anyway. So... No, that's never going to happen. But anyway, uh, so here's now my next scene that's loaded up. Now, my next scene that's loaded up has got this messy events uh, object in my scene, which means this is this is how I know that I'm, I've got events that I can listen to. However, if I'm using um, System Core, I don't have to worry about sticking an events manager in my scene, do I? Or do I? What are you wanting to do with your events? So no, you don't have to. This is the, the short and immediate answer. You could do these as game events. But remember, we were talking about balance. Yeah. It depends on what it is and what you're using it for. So are these game events or are these events that are scoped to something specific, to, to something within a smaller realm? All right. So I've got uh, lots of different silly things uh, going on in my events. So I've got things from... Uh, when a when a player has updated his character 
uh, inventory or, or, or his uh, stats, then it's just going to fire out events and saying, hey, this character's been changed uh, and this stuff's happened. Whoever's listening, you now you know. Or and I've got other events that just say, "Hey, I've I've loaded up and I'm I'm the I'm the manager and now I'm ready." And then we've got other stupid events like this. Now this is this is a great one. So I'm going to go and say, uh, "We plop." Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm going to say, uh, "Steam works fifty percent." So I wonder if that's going to cause a problem. Oh, no, it works. All right, so now I've got different profiles that I've created now uh, that I've saved. So when I click on this one, I've now uh, clicked it and I've got, hey, I've been clicked event. And now when I click on this one, I've got, hey, I've, I've been clicked event. And all of these are listening to say, was I clicked? No, it wasn't me, so I'm not going to show my UI. Uh, was I clicked? Yes, I was, so I'm going to show my UI. All right, so, so we've got some good use cases there. And just to throw our, our architecture hat on here for a second, because uh, yeah, we want to talk about system core. And all. System core is about making your game architecture better, better exactly. for you to develop on, better for you to maintain. So that doesn't necessarily mean use it for everything. You can, but you probably regret having so many events in there that you then have to go sift through in your project folder. So instead, think about your scopes. So your events with your UI, with clicking your different your UI and getting different results there. That's a good example of an event that is very narrow scoped. It's only relevant for the scope of this UI. So for something like that, I would use an event that's directly on this UI that's housed in this UI. It's only in memory or only available when this UI is active. Nothing else in the world should care about it. You do need to think about your design a little bit ahead of time. Maybe you will have something somewhere else that does need to know when you've moused over it, but probably not. Uh, let's assume in this case that nothing cares about the color of that box except for that box. In which case, that event belongs on the box, uh, scoped to that box. That way, even the header UI doesn't know about it. Where you might change that architecture slightly, just to give you an example of how you might branch that off. If you had, uh, where you can click on it here and over to a side or something, you had a detail window where you showed more details, where it needed to know what was selected. That would be a case where you'd move it up a scope, right? Mm -hmm. So you would go, instead of it being scoped on this record, you'd go up to whatever the parent object is for that. Uh, well, I say parent object, usually it'd be a parent object, but the the window or the, the scene or however you've got it architected, you'd go up a layer in scope. So that's an example of a narrow scope. Now you were talking about initializations of systems. That's a great example of a very high scope. So if you, you need to start thinking of your game as like a layer cake, you've got the, the top layer, the icing and all, going all the way down to the foundation of the cake holding everything up. So your system initializations, those are foundational. Probably every system mm. needs to know about that to some extent, needs to be able to get at it, but probably shouldn't be uh, dependent on all those objects, all the way through those layers. So that's a great example of an event that belongs or would be well served as part of your asset database. So as a game event from uh, our system score, as an example. Whereas something higher, like your UI events here, that's much higher up the cake. It's superficial. Nothing really cares about that except for what's touching uh, for that immediate context. So for that, you're narrowing that scope down and you're making it as part of the actual button logic that you've got going on there or something similar. Where that comes in to help you from a design point of view is you have less noise, first off. Events are great. They're wonderful. Uh, they, they help you eliminate loops and things like that. However, they are still a delegate. So what happens on the back end whenever you're calling an event and you're evoking it out, it has to go look all that up and run down it. That doesn't mean you should shy away from it. Just know that it's it's not free. And while it's not cluttering up your code so much that you don't have if checks all over the place or loops or whatever, it is still some weight. So you, you want to use them sparingly and you want to use them in narrow scope and you want to free them from memory where they're not relevant. A good example of that is your button being shown or not shown relevant while the UI is showing, not relevant when it's not. So drop it from memory if you can, unless you've got something deeper in your game that needs to know uh, uh, the last one highlighted was that one. And even then, I would think about it from an architectural point of view. Would that be better served as a scriptable event or as a scriptable variable? The differences between those two things is a variable 
yes, it has an event lets you know when it changes, but it also holds some information. So you could say, well, the last one selected was Steamworks 50% off. So maybe you have a variable that takes a string uh, and you would set that to Steamworks 50% off. And that would trigger a change event to let other things know, uh, but it would also just hold that there. So even when this UI closed, it still remembers Steamworks 50% sale. And that could be useful elsewhere. So it's just some quick examples of how I would go about thinking about breaking my things up, where I would use something foundational like systems core or something superficial like a, an event on a component or something similar. That is wonderful. That, that is really helpful. I was good because you just you took the words out of my mouth and say, you know, events are lovely, but what's the downside to that? I'm just spamming events everywhere. Uh, is you know, um, anything you want to? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a yet another event. So w what was the downside to that? Well, like, like you're saying, um, using spare, use them sparingly. Yeah, so you do want to use them sparingly. You want to remember that they are pointers. So this is something that a lot of C-sharp programmers don't ever have to worry about because pointer arithmetic is handled for us auto-magically, uh, but it's still there. You, yeah, you've got value types, you've got reference types, you have pointers. Pointers have to be looked up. So there is some tax to, to go fetch that data uh, to send stuff around. And that's not really a big deal most of the time. But if you go overboard, it can become a big deal. I do tend to go overboard a lot. I do too. Uh, and so uh, I'll just throw it out there before we go too deep into it. <laughs> the first and best rule you can be taught when you're, you're, you're learning the ideas of architecture and software development, and just engineering in general, do not optimize from the beginning. Take a look at your problem, break it down into smaller pieces, develop solutions for your pieces, review the whole, develop solutions for the whole. And then after you've gone through all that, that's when you go back through and you optimize. So don't paint yourself into a corner by, you know, going over the edge too far, but also don't go optimizing at every step is the, uh, the, the general best practice there. I should say good practice. I, I never liked the, uh, the best practice that suggests that there's only one right way. They're just I was gonna say, yeah, it's, it's, it's 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 very um pretentious that, that it, whole... it's a good practice to do that sort of thing uh to to go ahead and build it however you think works and then look at it so if you're comfortable as a developer if, if you're more comfortable making a game event and hooking it up then do that first just do it that way if it's quick and easy for you if you understand that's easy for you to keep it in your head and then when you go back to optimize go back and look at it so for me i'm usually more comfortable in uh code and in objects. So I would either do it as a C sharp event, uh, not a unity event, but a C sharp event, or I would do it as a scriptable object. If I was handing this off to Ola, who's one of our designers, I know he would go with the scriptable object first because that's where he'd be more comfortable. And now after he had done that, we would go back and we would optimize and we'd say, okay, well, we don't need a scriptable object for this because it's only relevant for this scope. And we need to save you know, a bit of memory. We need to save a bit of processing, what have you. Uh, Chad says that's more or less what I'm doing for che um, for chess of the mages. Now Yonan's making wizards chess. For those who don't know, uh, come over exclamation mark Discord and check out in the, in the showcase. It's, it's amazing. It's voice activated wizards chess. He's also sticking over into VR. Um, I like events myself. Says RQ. Oh, the bet built the thing and now spent the last couple of weeks optimizing. Uh, there you go. And it's it, it's a great it's a great. Um, process of working i've i am on my 20th refactor this week of mux uh, as i mentioned earlier today's refactoring of mux is completely uh buggered um one part uh, and i'll i'll show it now in chat what i buggered um i'm quite pr i'm quite proud of of it uh so let me just find a random uh outfit to wear and uh go over here to, to this bloke uh, and now Penny has a great new optimizing course. Shameless plug. Plug it away, buddy. Plug it away. Exclamation mark. Holistic 3D. His beard shouldn't be shown. For the one what people wondering what the issue is, his beard should actually be hidden because it's being suppressed by this mod. Now, I don't agree that it should be entirely hidden because you, know, it's, you can still see his moustache. It should be there. Or, the problem or for the art department. Exactly. That's, a problem. That's an art department's problem. But, but in since he say that this 
this should be suppressing the face. Uh, if I now uh, go uh, and, and move over, uh, see like this, it's, it, it's, it's not suppressed, but if I change his, his head covering, it is now remembered that it should be suppressed. Um, so yeah, that, that's today's bug that I've got unbroken. And now if I go back to female, she's got his, his, his beard. Um, so I, I decided to stop uh, playing about with it and I went and watched Harry, the second Harry Potter movie with the kids instead. And again, this uses uh, events in that when I'm uh, changing something, it's, it's firing off an event to say which slot was changed and for whom. Uh, as well as changing the entire uh, stats of a, of a of sort of like for example, this is male or female. It could be going from a um, from a, an orc to a to a to an elf or whatever. And those are all kicking off events as well. So so with that that in mind, what kind of event would you have for that then? Like if like for for now, if I'm just changing changing what beard my lady has. Yeah. So in this situation. Because you've got something, uh, so here's how you would go about thinking about it. What is the thing that I'm changing, the head, the hair, whatever else? Does that have any effect? And it's all about scopes. Mm -hmm. Where is that effect? Is it just within the scope of the head when I'm changing the head? No, it's not. Uh, because you have the rule that the beard should hide, right? Exactly. So I would have each one of them fire off an event, but they would all be firing off the same event. And that event is simply that the character changed. Not necessarily what part changed, that's not relevant data. So we'd simply say, my character has changed, here's the new character. And however you're storing that in your system, you would hand that to a handler, your event handler, that takes that data in and says, okay, here's the new character. So I need to go make the current character this character. That would help with your problem with your facial hair not hiding, for example. it's I don't know what you've got with your code base, but it sounds to me it's an order of operations problem. And if you'll raise the scope of that event from right now, you've got it very granular. It's on each one of the buttons. If you raise it up a notch to where it's more of character changed. Uh, so now that handler is, okay, character changed. I don't know what, and I personally don't care. I'm simply going to go through this and make sure that the character I'm rendering matches this new config. So beard goes off on a female or hides in a helmet or what have you. It's actually the serialization that, that ended up like so if I turn off the serialization it works perfectly uh, but you know for those who are wondering how I broke it um, so uh, I can't sharing all the windows will actually break at the moment uh, so this this here um, exactly is actually I usually describing it it's kind of like you know everyone's going hey you know something changed hey we're all listening to it um, but it's that dirty little bugger that's saving everything is going hey i'm getting the right information and because i try to be too clever loader i try to be i try to be so clever in that if i've got buttons um for changing race or class or gender every time you click one of those buttons it stay it saves a copy of the state of the character at that time that you clicked it so that should you revert back to that same combination of race, class, and gender, it will remember the last one you chose. And when I was talking to somebody else, they said, did you anyone ever ask you for that feature? And I said, no. They said, did it work before you had that feature? Yes. Why don't you just get rid of that feature? But now <laughs> it feels more of it's a matter of principle that I can't let it beat me. Uh, I, I get that. I get that. <laughs> and uh, with something like that, that's the type of feature that makes your player think, oh, that's nice. It does. It's like, exactly. It's one of those extra little things that. that... So, so instead of going at it with, instead of looking at it as the source of a problem, think about other ways that it can solve the problem that's being presented. So the problem that you're trying to fix there, that that feature is trying to fix is you want your system to remember the last state of a race gender combination, I'm assuming, right? Uh, yeah, it's more, it's more annoyingly complex than that. It's um, the state of the race class gender combination of the state of every single possible uh, combination of 
uh, buttons that they might have pressed uh, of, of, of mounted but, objects. But you don't care about the combination of the objects, right? You only care about the race, class, gender combination. Uh, I, I care about what was what was stored for that combination. Yes. Right. Yeah, you're right. So it's a dictionary. Yeah. So what I would do is I would pack my race, class, gender combination into some singular value. Tons of ways you can go about that. Don't worry about that at the moment. And I would store that value. And I would, so the resulting value of all the current settings. And I would only do that if you chase, if you changed race, class, or gender. So I wouldn't try to save everything all the time. I wouldn't save it on every change. I would save just a snapshot of the result before the change into the dictionary. And I would just treat it as a dictionary, right? So I, I wouldn't take it as the gospel. I would simply check if I have an entry for this new race class combination that you loaded into. And I would check and see if I have a valid serialized set of settings. If I do, load them up. If I don't, bugger off. Not a problem. Oh my god. That's wonderful. I didn't even think about doing it like that. The I hardest part of that would be converting your key to... Uh, so converting your key to something as simple and quick, but that's probably not a big deal since... You've got well, a finite number of races, genders. Well, it, 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 it's even easier than that because they're all they're all uh, an indexed value anyway. Because 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 they uh, if I if I go to my oh now it's called see now it's called mux settings, which is still sexy in its yeah, name. Yeah, so you can just uh, you can bitwise pack that into a yeah. single int. So it used to be called messy settings, and I actually got complaints. Oh, I've already got it docked in there. I got complaints that it shouldn't be called messy settings. <laughs> Why is that? Because because it because it just doesn't sound. It sounds a little bit alarming. Uh, hash it and call it a day. Nibble says. Yeah, that'll work. I like to pack myself. Um, it's just similar. So using your int as four bit values or byte values rather is handy. Of course, you don't have to be that fancy. And at first, don't be that fancy. You could make a struck or whatever else, just pack it in there, just get it working. The idea is that you have a singular key, which represents your race, gender, class combination. You have a serialized value, which is your dictionary value. Later on, you can decide how you want to serialize or how you want to uniquely identify that combination because it may be relevant elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're gonna integrate with Steam, for example, and uh, one of the things we do in Steam is we store additional data on our leaderboards so that we can know what was your race, class, gender combination when you got that high score. Oh, well, wow. If, in that case, you have to pack it into an int. Well, you don't have to, but the most efficient thing to do would be to pack it into an int because the additional data on a leaderboard is an int array. So there you go. Go with an int stack, and which is why I probably favor packing ints because I do a lot with Steam. Uh, but if you want to go with something more complicated, if you were going to serialize a UGC, well, in that case, you know, no reason to bother packing it so tightly or in such an obtuse way. You can go with a struct or something else or a hash key, whatever, what have you. Oh, this, this is this is gold dust. I'm glad we I'm glad we're having this chat on this because I'm just I'm making notes down. I'm writing as we're talking, buddy. This is. I hope I hope you're writing this down at home as well. If if anyone's uh. You know, want to go and get some good tips, uh, and if you're wanting to get a great guide on optimization, head over to uh, Holistic 3D using the coupon opt underscore launch, and you can get the Udemy course uh, from uh, Holistic 3D for optimization. And also, Holistic 3D's got their own website where they've got um, courses as well, not just over on Udemy as well. Uh, if you're wondering who Holistic 3D is, uh, I did an interview with Penny. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, and full disclosure, BitGamey goes and works for them as well. Um, but BitGamey is lovely, so we, so, so we allow it. Mate, um, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this down. Now, I was supposed to spend time with the kids tomorrow, but I'm sure they won't mind sitting on the floor in my little den as I'm typing away. Uh, and, and, and now making these changes um daddy can we play we are playing it's called look at daddy code my 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 son actually enjoys the game get rid of all of the red squiggles in visual ah. studio like <laughs> daddy red squiggle 
Red Squiggle! Yes, we must kill the Red Squiggle by writing correct code. Let's do it, son! <laughs> and he's also, his other favourite game is reading Daddy's Discord chats out loud next, next to Mummy. So, <laughs> since they're reading things out, just make sure that I haven't written anything in chat about how much money we're spending on the asset store. And if you're wondering about what you're going to spend your money on the asset store, do you know what I'm going to say? Exclamation mark, Steamworks. Currently 50% off as this part of this massive sale that, see, that Unity have got going on at the moment. Yet another shameless plug in. Thank you so much, Big Gamer, for the exclamation mark, Steamworks. And if you're wondering, you can also use the code for the Holistic 3D's Learn website as well as the Udemy one. There will be different codes. Brilliant. Um, so that that code is valid for HD Holistic 3D's. Uh, yeah, so there will be another one for Udemy. And he's next done an exclamation mark messy sale, bit gamey, you're professional. I forgive you for getting that we interviewed more mountains. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Now, uh, you're gonna be doing version twos. Pardon me, my voice my voice just cracked there because I need a sip of water. You're doing version twos of everything. Mm -hmm. yep. When when you've got the updated bouncing bottoms, could you come back and show us your bouncing bottom? Bradley, and it'll have so much more than just bouncing bottoms. <gasps> Whoa! You had me at bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be bouncing and swaying and swinging and flowing and floating and all sorts of things. <laughs> and we can get all super geeky with it too, with you know the quadratic drag. And I love quadratic equations; they're fun. <laughs> As in, I never told you that you need to, you might need some help. <laughs> Although saying that, if Irish John is in chat, uh, exclamation mark water for Irish John, uh, you always need to have decent physics on your water, uh, and uh, and if you if you want to be playing about, you can use a fizz kit as well. I just bought it. There you go. I oh, okay. you. Just bought yourself a, a optimization course, mate. Thank you so much for coming in again. I've had an absolute last it's been so informative i've learned so much i've also learned that i'm going to be using uh, steamworks version 2 with mirror with uh, first gear games mirror uh, improvements for the physics uh, along with playfab and uh, and then letting my kids uh, be able to play against mommy while mommy and daddy are on the computer using steam from steamworks uh, i didn't even realize that stack was a possibility that's amazing yeah it's it's a great little stack hooking those those three up together with the uh steam and playfab in particular especially if you're looking at going multi-platform but even just within the platform of steam having that uh ease of access to a trusted server to do so much more not just with inventory i meant to mention that earlier uh i don't want to run you off on time but um no no please do Something a lot of indies run into with their games is they finally get a bit of a bit of a user base behind them. They're starting to make some success, and you you get the pricks that come in. And knowing that it's a client only game, they you know they flood the leaderboards with bullshit scores. Or they give themselves all the achievements and all the stats are racked up, and that messes up uh, your legitimate players' experience with it because they can't get up on the leaderboard. And there are things you can do. But running your Steam achievements, stats, and uh, leaderboards to where they can only be set by trusted helps alleviate that issue. But that does require a backend service provider. So that does require a PlayFab or an AWS. But that prevents, if, uh, if you work with Steam at all, you realize just how easy it is to compromise that API when it's set to client only. Not a problem for a single player game, not a problem for a small indie getting going, but as you grow, as you start to scale, you do want to give your players a better experience. You want them to be able to get the high rank on the leaderboard or to look at their stats and see legitimately how they compare against other legitimate players. And so it becomes meaningful to you as a game developer that your players have that experience. That's where the PlayFab kind of thing helps out there because it gives you that trusted back end that you can use. I didn't even realize that was a thing. Oh, my word. Now, there's a ton of achievement crackers out there and all. Because so many games, even AAA games, don't bother. I mean, not that I would ever hack or steal a game, but I was in the process of downloading uh, a game that I won't name since it is easy to compromise. 
and it was giving me hell because I'm in uh, northern Donegal where we have real crap internet connection. So I got the game files down and I convinced the game that it was running as app 480 so I could get it to play while I was waiting for it to properly download. And the reason I was able to do that is because it wasn't set up properly. That was a AAA game whose name shall not be named for its own safety, but it's not an uncommon thing to make those types of mistakes. Steamworks can help you with that. Heathen Steamworks Complete can help you with that sort of thing. Oh, wow. I'm so gonna, I'm, you know I'm going to ask you on Discord uh, later <laughs> which game that is, just just so I can make myself feel better. Um, it's always nice when you see AAA studios uh, basically go, you know what? Fudge it. I'm not... I'm not going to spend my time on that. I'm going to spend my time on something else. And it just makes you realize that you don't have to be perfect. You, in your you'd bedroom. be surprised at how many of them do, yeah. especially when it comes to platform integrations, the third parties in particular, that when it's their own platform, they integrate really well. They're nice and secure. But when they start supporting third party platforms, especially if they're going to ship on Steam or on GOG, they kind of phone. I, I don't, I don't want to say they phone it in. They do a good quality job but they're not as concerned about the player experience with regards to the social features, with the security features around it, because Valve gives you all of that. It's all right there. You just have to use it. There's nothing fancy or black magic-y about it. It's just having the wherewithal to use it and making sure that, you know, your players have a good experience wherever they can. Now, it's, it's also fair to say I'm an indie and I can't have an operating cost. So yeah, there will be pricks out there who will jack up the, the score and give themselves the top score every time. That's unfortunate, but that's something we have to accept to have that zero operating score or that zero operating level. But just as soon as you're able to, at least for us anyway, we want to give that, that extra level of quality to the players. So having those back-end service providers that are becoming increasingly indie friendly. Well, like you said, you were showing the cost of the, the PlayFab stuff. Um, if you're offsetting most of the, the heavy lifting to Steam, which like you keep on saying, they're taking their 30% anyway. So yeah. they're taking their 30%. You're getting all of this stuff. You might as well use it. You, if you're offsetting all of that heavy lifting over onto Steam, then by the end of the day, you're not paying that um, hardly any money at all. Or you could even get away with that, you know, on that free uh, pay-as-you-go uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very, very affordable to get going. And by the time you're overflowing that, where you need to consider paying up for the bigger tiers... You're making money, hopefully. Yeah, you've got enough gamers then, because you, you clearly have enough gamers then if you've overflown that. That or you're doing something wrong architecturally and come talk to me. Uh, but you've got enough gamers then, you should be able to handle the cost. They're, they're reasonably priced, uh, especially compared to how it used to be. These services have been around forever. Microsoft bought PlayFab. PlayFab existed before Microsoft had it. I don't know what PlayFab's prices were, but like GameSparks and things like that, they've been around for quite a while. It's just they haven't always been so indie friendly. It's been expensive to really leverage that level of quality, but now it's becoming increasingly indie friendly for small game studios, small projects, low operating cost types of experiences to be able to leverage a trusted back end that's a wonderful thing and we I chatted uh i didn't i haven't managed to grab him on the stream but hopefully now that things have calmed down the developer of phasmophobia who's a member of our discord and as it has been for many years since day one actually i love that game uh and we chatted to him about well i chatted to him because what the question is how much money is it costing you because he's using photon he's using pun uh and uh he basically said look it's, it's costing me because because they he I think at one point he he was obviously their biggest customer because they were he was one of the biggest games on Steam at one point, um, topping the the charts. He was it was costing him a lot of money, uh, and he, he basically explained to me just how I won't go into details because it was private how much money it was costing. However, you can do the maths by looking at the Steam stats to see how many players. He had now it's not a reoccurring monthly revenue but you've got those players who have purchased your game he made his money he's making enough money every month to pay for those uh, services the problem happens uh, when your game has been going for so many years and you're not getting that reoccurring revenue yet you still have a very active uh, 
a client base. Now, hopefully, if that was the case, then you know, if they had, you still had an active client base, they, they would be bringing new new customers in. You've got to be very unfortunate if you've still got a high number of regular clients and not a single one of them has referred a single friend to bu to buy your game. Something's got to be going wrong at that point. You can help with your uh, operating costs with your long tail as well. That's where we're getting into the publishing services that, that Heathen's looking at offering. So managing your live operations costs early in your game's life cycle is, yes, much more expensive. Those are all going to say under construction. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so those are, in the, in the early days, it's, that's your highest point. And it is going to taper off. So look for service providers that scale. And scale goes in both directions. This day and age, almost all of them do. There's a few that still have contracts, which will lock you into particular uh, sets. But to my knowledge, AWS does not, which is GameLift, and uh, Microsoft does not, which is PlayFab. With those, you can buy a bucket, which makes it a little cheaper. So if your game has scaled up in that, in that early hump, you can pay the 100 a month or whatever for the big bucket that gets you a, a big old wad. But then when your, game, your players taper off, because they will, exactly. uh, you go down to pay as you go. So you, you drop that, uh, that hundred a month, or if your game is just blown up and it's super successful, it's, I think it's 2k a month. So that that's, you know, wild success level, but you can drop back down. You're not in a couple of year contract because that can really hurt an indie As scaling can, can kill an indie. You, you can be killed by success because you have that problem, right? If you're using something like G portal or some yeah. of the, the, the systems that don't scale well, you only have two choices. And you kind of have to predict up, up front. So you're going to say, all right, well, my game is not going to be too successful or my budget doesn't allow my game to be too successful. I can't scale up. So keep me down at this level. Then your players are trying to come in. There's not enough resources. It all falls over. You end up losing players. You're not just leaving money on the table. You're losing players and making a bad experience for them. Yeah. And maybe those aren't coming back. Yeah, no. Players are super fickles. So if they have a bad experience on the start, most of them won't come back. Players like everybody that's on this channel, they'll probably come back. We we all apparently love the game industry long enough to hear a couple of middle-aged men talk about stuff uh, related to it. That's not the average gamer. The average gamer, it's entertainment for them. It's recreation. It's a pastime. They're chilling out. They're not putting up with your game, not running perfectly the moment they touch it. And you've lost them if it didn't. So that first experience is quite important. That's why that big hunt there is so important. It's why some studios that thought their game was going to be super successful, so they, they invested in it, and then they fell over because they couldn't afford it afterwards. So many studios that get closed down, or, or have to close down, rather, after they've launched, even if the game was successful, because they either overestimated or underestimated. But fortunately, uh, service providers have become more indie-friendly. There's more of the pay-as-you-go, which I'm not trying to, there are downsides to that as well. Pay as you go is slightly more expensive than paying for the bucket, but you can control and mitigate your cost. So if you go play as you go, cause you're not sure how your game's gonna do, you're watching your cost jump up. All right, it's very successful. I have the money now, let's go ahead and buy this bigger bucket that lowers my operating costs percentage wise down a bit and my players can expand. I don't have to worry about things falling over because I've set it to allow to scale up to a certain extent. And you do have control over that, right? So you can say, scale up to this extent, but don't go past that. That's your, oh shit, Mark, I'm, I'm not sure how to handle things. I need to consult. Uh, but you can scale up to that point automatically. And then at that point, it'll stop scaling and then you need to take action. You either need to decide, are you gonna pony up or are you going to kind of mitigate the, uh, the risk? which you see that with games are with different games and they handle it in different ways. Um, Valheim was quite successful all of a sudden. And it kind of had that, that growing pain. I, I don't know the studio personally, but you could see it where, with how they were running their operations, uh, their servers were doing perfectly fine at first. It, it felt like P to P. Um, I know they had some lots of issues with it dropping in all theirs. They were becoming quite successful for, it just seemed to blow up on them. And then they got a grip on it pretty quickly. I don't know what backend service providers they were using, but you could see that lag in there. And that lag has killed many a studio. We had, a, we actually went um, and paid for our own Valheim uh, server for, for a while, uh, we, we, which was fun. But even just see how 
um, what we were talking about before about making your optimizing your game and look at your game architecture which if you're going to be doing multiplayer have that in mind uh, you know relatively at the start so are you doing the best thing for a multiplayer game or are you just going to cause a load of problems for your for your players you know, and, and if it's multiplayer what kind of multiplayer four players eight players a hundred a thousand is peer to peer it? client server co-op competitive yeah, so many so many questions make make yourself a design document you know just on, on, on a napkin at least some ideas of what you're going to be doing there's a handy little free tool out there it's sketchboard i think it's called let me see if i can find it real quick oh, better than ms paint not sketchup uh yeah it's slightly better than ms paint i mean not day and night better but a bit better <laughs> uh, uh, push it to me on Discord, otherwise the bot is going to ban you for one you second. Gotta find it first. Sketchboard. Yeah, I'll push it to you on Discord if I find uh, it. Irish John, we were talking about you earlier. Were your ears burning? There you go. This little tool. Free tool, cheap and easy. It just lets you sketch out your designs if you're a visual type person. I mean, I would typically like a whiteboard, but these days I work in a kitchen, not too far from the... Uh, the refrigerator as one should and i do not have room for a massive whiteboard so instead i use this tool it also has some some cool collab features if your if your fridge is white your fridge is your whiteboard yeah mine's one of those little skinny built-in ones oh they are i terrible. hate those things oh. um so irish john uh so that you know fizzkit is getting a version two update uh obviously with the lovely dancing bottoms but the thing that might interest you Irish more is things like uh, this kind of stuff, these kind of shenanigans. So that uh, Irish is is making pirates game uh, with lovely big pirates boat ships on on the on the waves. So he's looking at our uh, buoyancy tools inside of Fizzkit. What water system, if any, does Fizzkit integrate with? So our idea behind Fizzkit is we handle the physics side. We want you to be able to use it with any water system you like. So what you're seeing there in the, the video that was playing, those are buoyancy calculations. We have three of them that the system runs. Uh, they're basically different levels of complexity from simple to super complex. So it's doing all the, the math, so figuring out the hull, the density of the water, and how the buoyancy should work. You should be able to plug that into any water system that can report its surface height. Wow. Anything. So long as it, all it needs to do. The, so what we're doing there is a simple little sign it calculation on our uh, surface generator. All you have to do is be able to tell the buoyancy system what the surface of the water is at some given location. So that's what it's doing is it's finding the surface of the water where the points of contact on the boat are and then calculating the buoyancy based on the boat's density, the water's density. So all of that deals with kind of the, the proto idea that we had with um, physics data. And what we're doing there is the boat has some physics data. It knows its density, it knows its geometry. And then the water has some physics data. It knows its density and the surface is its geometry. And so we use those and we can calculate the drag on the boat, which is why it doesn't just accelerate infinitely. Just and the idea is like a real object, it will accelerate up until the point that the drag begins to exceed the acceleration force, it's quadratic drag. Uh, and then the fact that it floats. If you took something and push it under, when that scene first starts, you'll see all the boxes fall and they'll sink down in the water a bit. You'll see them slow down and come back up. We're not cheating there. That's not just a, a lerp back to surface. That's taking the volume of the box, uh, what mass we told it that box had. So it's calculating the density. It's falling into the water. It knows the contact points and it's floating up. And yes, that's all way excessive for what you see there in the scene. That's us showing off the demo scene. Uh, what it can do. You can also turn that down to a simpler version where it's simply doing point, point buoyancy calculations as opposed to a full mesh. Or if you want it somewhere in between those two, it can do bounding box uh, buoyancy calculations. So you get some control on you know, just how detailed you want your floating physics to be. If you're doing like a pretty ship that you want to look all cinematic like, uh, you might want to go with the full mesh calculation what it's going to do is for every vertice it will calculate the buoyancy force uh, being applied to it based and, uh, on the density of the water and everything else dancing bottoms buoyancy bottoms so with version two uh, 
Is this going to be a complete rewrite from the ground up, or is this a, a small fix or a small update? Are we, lo are we looking at a large percentage improvement on performance? I had to be quite large. So it is a, a full rewrite. We're taking all the ideas. I don't like to use the term rewrite because we're not throwing out what's there, but we're going through all the pieces we have at the moment. Uh, any of them that are superfluous, that aren't being, that aren't adding some value to the system that are just making it more complicated, we will either remove or we will make them open source that you can add in voluntarily. Uh, and then everything that is fundamental will go into a foundation and that foundation will be free. And then everything uh, that's built on top of that, like the buoyancy system, um, the physics bone or the anti bone system, all of those types of things will go into the new complete. And the whole idea here is that we're unifying the ideas. If you look at the current phys kit, it's got a math library that's in there, has a whole bunch of formulas worked out. It's got some constants uh, that are frequently used. And it was all really just trying to help you do those physics -y type things uh, without having to go to Google and look up the formulas or whatnot. We, we had them pre-built. And then for the common things that our users were asking for and that uh, we were needing to use in our own apps, we went ahead and built out tools like the surface tool, the buoyancy body, and the antibone. Um, and so that's where those came from. V2 is to take all of those, completely rewrite them into a unified kit uh, that's nice and modular, that a designer can take and drag and drop one item and have it just work. So if you want her hair to swing and flow, you drop the antibone on the root node of the hair and it will flow. <clears throat> and then you can tweak the settings as you desire. Or if you want to get all nitpicky with it, say you wanted to make a uh, a bit of foliage on the ground and you wanted it to push out of the way as a result of a physics calculation, for some reason you wanted to do that with joints, you can use Antibone for that as well. We'll probably end up renaming Antibone as well because when we first designed it, it was for hair, tails, breasts, buttocks, any kind of jiggly bits on a humanoid character, on a skinned mesh that you needed to have move around. It evolved beyond that to be any time you had a chain of transforms that you needed to propagate their change down the chain. So it became a joint, effectively, a physics joint. And so that's where we're moving it, is we're taking it over into being to acting more like a unity physics joint would. It's just this is a, a chain of physics joints. And this is coming out next week, you said? <laughs> UX will be the next one out because that one's slightly bigger. Uh, but FizzKit will be coming out after UX. Uh, where's oh, that, Unity's done it again. So if you're scrolling down, it has this div just blocks everything. Um, here we go. Uh, the, uh, the UIX complete, that's, is that, that's, that's the one you're talking about. Yeah, so it's getting a name change again. So UIX Complete was originally about user interface experience. That's what UIX stands for. So that's what it was originally focused on. We had you know, the on-screen keyboard. Uh, we had different types of controls like tree views and all that. Um, and that's good and great, but um, it's really about the user experience is what we really wanted to work on. So we'll still have those. We'll still have our, we'll call them advanced controls. But then we also have a whole bunch of lower level controls, system controls. So there's the, what do we have there? The system manager, the help manager, uh, the tutorial, or not tutorial system, the feedback system. There's a number of systems that have been developed internally that we're bringing into UX complete. The one that we like to play with the most is the feedback one. So what the feedback system does is it uh, will scrape uh, data about your game so a lot like Unity's log, but it builds out its own because it has a bit of additional data on top of it. And your player can effectively push a button. It'll grab a screenshot. It'll pack all that in. It'll grab the full log. It'll pack all that in. And then it can push it up to Trello or into an email or whatever else. So your player can report a bug with some meaningful information aside from your game broke, fix it. So that's the idea behind that one. Uh, and then things like the scene manager Heathen always works with all of our projects. We always work additive loaded, async. We manage our own scenes. We don't allow things like Mirror's Network Manager to manage scenes. And that's good and great. And it does a lot of things from us, for us from an architectural point of view, but it can also be a bit cumbersome for designers and all like Olav to have to mess with. He, he shouldn't have to bother with that. And 
I shouldn't have to fix it for him. So what the scene manager does is handles that for you. It understands the idea of a bootstrapping system. Uh, so what initialized the game? It understands the concept that certain things must persist. It understands that there is a special scene uh, or a special set of objects or scene, which is effectively your title or your menu. Names are still a bit in flux. And then it has the ability to batch load all of the rest as you desire. So the idea there is that someone like Olav, who's our designer, can say, I want to batch load this area. And it might be four or five different scenes. It will handle loading those all at the same time. He can then also say, I want to unload these four or five scenes and it'll unload all of those for him. Or he can do one, two at a time. It, it gives him the ability to handle that a bit nicer. It's not dissimilar from the idea of Unity's own scene manager, just on steroids uh, and designed with the first principle that scene structure and scene architecture is important to the game's overall architecture. And then there's a bunch of other stuff in there as well. Like I said, UX is big because uh, it's about user experience and that's a really big topic. Well, yeah, because without that, you don't have a you don't have a, a product, let alone a game. Um, man, that's I, I mean, we said that an hour ago that was going we were going to say goodbye, but he was just uh, Wizards Own Code took the words out of my mouth. This is without doubt the most valuable interview to date. Do it again next month, please. And we said this last time Loden came on that we started we started talking about one thing and ended up basically having a, a, a lesson. On on not only game development but uh, development in general uh, and 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 yeah it's always it's always a pleasure and thankfully they'll be doing a load of updates from Even Engineering uh, giving us the perfect excuse to uh, to drag him out back again uh, and and actually um, was really generous of only coming on um, basically short notice because we had we had a, a bit of shuffling on the stream next week we've got. Uh, Two Cubes the, uh, of Game Kit Controller is coming on. Got yet another thousandth update of the week that he's been uh, pushing on the Game Kit Controller. Uh, so uh, join us next week. Exclamation mark. Stingworks in chat once again because it is. I mean, he's here. It's a 50% sale. We might as well pimp it. All right, buddy. Uh, thanks again for popping in. Uh, such late notice. I really do appreciate it. You are You are a legend. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. If you want to see more of my crazy videos, click on the left side of your screen now. And down below, there's that big juicy subscribe button. And right next to it is the magic bell that if you click it, it will tell you if I've got a new video coming out. Till next time. <laughs>